Good morning and welcome to the second day of our conference on reconstruction of religious buildings in 20th century and 21st century Europe. We will start today uh, in Lviv and head over to Sofia Korol and Oksana Heri. Sofia Korol is the head of art history department, ethnology Institute at the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. And Oksana Heri is a senior researcher at the art history department at the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. And we are very interested in what they have to tell us. The floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, we are very glad to join the conference. If we are trying to start with our demonstration. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for your invitation to participate in this uh, important scientific event. And I'll start with uh, talking about the beginning of the session of local acoustic expression in church architecture in Galicia. Galicia is the region that up to the first partnering of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1772 became the part of the Habsburg monarchy and subsequently the Austro Hungarian Empire and became the Sorry, uh, You need to uh, get more on the mic. Um, we can't hear you closer. Excuse me, please you repeat the, the, the question. Now we hear you better. You you need to uh, be closer to the mic. Ah, ah okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Our microphone is not So, uh, Galicia became the easternmost and largest province of this state, Austro Hungarian Empire. The map of 1897 shows Galicia in pink. This is a red dot in the middle, making the capital of the wind, Lviv, here Lambert. The largest Christian communities in Galicia were formed by ethnic Ukrainians and Poland. Today, Eastern Galicia is part of Ukraine, while Western Galicia is part of Poland. Uh, during the last quarter of the uh, 19th century, despite the lack of sovereignty, the Ukrainian society of Galicia had significant success in economic growth and cultural development. The successful functioning of financial and economic institutions, insurance companies, cooperative movements, and small entrepreneurship provided more opportunities for the realization of cultural needs. At the turn of the 19th and 20th century, many prominent Ukrainian cultural institutions operate in Galicia. The Shevchenko Scientific Society, the prototype of a State Academy of Sciences, literally musical and visual society. One of the most rapidly developed styles of architecture was architecture, in particular church architecture. Almost every church was either restored or a new building was erected. After the abolition of uh, in uh, 1848 of the requirement to build churches according to a standard template developed in Vienna and uh, influenced by Romanticism, architects began to taking an interest in local artistic tradition and incorporate their characteristic elements into their work. This was primarily manifested in the use of a dome placed over the cruciform structure or over the central part of the three-chambered structure. It reflected the tradition of local wooden church architecture. For the external design classical forms were initially used uh, however, the religious roots of the Ukrainians trace back to Byzantine culture, and classical elements did not align with the region's history. At that time, knowledge of Byzantine art was limited, so the Nice architect Theophil von Hansen's chapel 
in view set as a starting point for searching the external form of the Ukrainian church. Uh, this epithet deliberately built non Catholic churches for Greek, Protestant, Ukrainian, in an exotic or Catholic Europe style, incorporating elements of Romanesque and Moorish architecture. The real artist saw this as a model in the style of Byzantine revival. Therefore, in the 1880s, the Western Havrashkevich and other architects built churches in similar shape. Architect Vasil Nahirny continued the same direction. He received his education at the Polytechnic School in Zurich and wanting to develop Ukrainian architecture, studied Byzantine monuments in Milan, Venice, and Trier. However, he felt that his education would be incomplete without visiting Kiev. In 1883, after the several visa rejections from the Russian Empire government, the architect finally visited Kiev. He was impressed by the Baroque Cathedral with five domes, but he created it so that he was strongly influenced by the newly constructed St. Polodemus Cathedral. The cathedral represented a different vision of the Byzantine revival than the European church, because the architect of the Russian Empire had the opportunity to study authentic Byzantine churches building in Armenia, Georgia, etc. The Russian emperor wanted to celebrate the 900th anniversary of the Christianization of Kiev, as it bolstered his claim to the ancientness of imperial culture. Therefore, the government allocated significant funds for artists to travel to Greece, Armenia, and Georgia. However, Ukrainian Vasil Nahirny perceived these forms as a reminder of Ukrainian own culture history. So he used them generously in his work. He often placed domes on tall drums with semicircular cornices about windows, used triforium windows, and created a nine compartment special composition. However, he never proposed semicircular completion of a wall, a so called the Komar, like those in St. Volodymyr Cathedral, uh, only triangular sediment, similar to Teutile from Hansen's Chapel. Until 1900, most churches in Western Ukraine were built in the Byzantine revival style with Romanist decorative elements. Their affiliation with Ukrainian religious culture was emphasized by the cruciform composition with a high-rise central dome. Meanwhile, Catholic churches were constructed with stylized Gothic elements. For instance, buildings by Julian Zakharyevich commissioned by different communities, Greek Catholic, in village Nastasi and the Roman Catholic in village Vitni were created during the same period by the same architects in different styles. These aesthetic preferences aligned with the general trend of a Byzantine revival trend developed in Europe. First, where the central dome and decorative elements played a crucial crucial role, such as uh, the Metropolitan Cathedral in Athens, in the Greek Church in Vienna, as the Notre Dame de la Garde in Moscow. Later, parallel to study of Byzantine construction solutions by European architects, three conch and tetra conch churches were spread. Western Ukrainian artists also tend to these structures. As the first was Edgar Kovac, Professor from the Polytechnic, who proposed the extension of the Basilica in Zhokla in 1901. Later, the three-conch form became fertile ground for 
creative search of uh, architects in the modernist style, such as Alexander Lestensky and Lev Levin. It's essential to note that the fundamental features in designing such architecture defined by the Brazilian building, such as the dry partition, dome over the main compartment, and pyramidal composition, they are preserved. After World War I, architects continued to develop this compositional sense and in more stylized functional forms, like constructivist building. The search of national self expression was shifting into church interior. My colleague Sophia will talk about this period. Thank you very much. So, as Oksana said, then after the First World War, these changes and revival uh, uh, turned into the interior. So we, I would like to speak not uh, about the whole changes and revivals and uh, uh, decorations forms, but just on, uh, I will stress on the example of the proposition made by two artists, Pablo Jun and Mikhail Osinchuk. But I will shortly describe the whole uh, process uh, that took place. Uh, in, in that time here in uh, Galicia. The, so the intensive construction movement, as Oksana has shown, was interrupted uh, by the outbreak of World War the First. Another phenomenon associated with it uh, is the issue of preserving, conserving, or restoring old wooden architecture and its interior decoration. The Galician School of Wooden Architecture is a prominent and recognized phenomena of the world's artistic heritage, as evidenced in particular, for example, by the St. George uh, Church in the hall, which to the left, and you see an example wooden, of wooden Baroque architecture. Increased the financial resources and the need for larger churches prompted local communities to build modern, larger stone churches. As a result, wooden old buildings were rarely left standing sometimes sold to other communities, and most often simply dismantled. So the problem of preserving all the interior furnishing, iconostasis, altars, and separate icons erased very sharply. It was uh, at, the, at this time that Metropolitan of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, Andrei Sheptetsky, and I, uh, like to remind you that this church institution erased when in uh, 1596 it transferred from the ecum ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople to the jurisdiction of the Holy See, thereby forming the uh, Ukrainian, means Ukrainian Union Church. So Metropolitan Sheptetsky, realizing the importance of the of ancient art, the church art, which was the thus uh, threatened with destruction, first established a private museum of church art in uh, 1905, and then in 1913 bought new premises and presented his museum to the Ukrainian uh, people. Under the direction of uh, Dr. Hilarion Sintinsky, this museum became both a treasure trove of Ukrainian ancient art and a kind of laboratory for uh, the new church art. The preoccupation with the search for a national style under the influence of the formation of social and political consciousness at the edge of the 1920th centuries led to a turn to the beginnings of national art. The restoration work in St. Sophia Cave, as Sanam have mentioned, and the construction of St. Vladimir's Cathedral uh, in Cave also to celebrate millennium of the baptism of Rus clearly indicated the sources for the renewal of the natural, uh, national artistic culture. Mikhail Boychuk was the first who realized the importance of ancient art. He studied in Vienna and Munich, but was inspired by the Italian Proto-Renaissance and Byzantine art of Venice, Florence, and Ravenna. During his stay in Paris, he appreciated the latest searches in the art, but decided to reject individualism and look for the fundamentals 
in ancient Ukrainian art. Uh, this tendency to simplification and symbolism, generaliz generalization of the image, which was emphasized uh, him even by the way uh, he worked in his studio. All his students worked together like a medieval art head, and neglecting all the individualism. Individualism for it led this artist to the monumentalist. In fact, Wojciech's influence all subsequent searches for the some uh, something new in art have followed the path of monumentalism in one way or another. He paved the way for modern art, especially decorative. Petro Holodny, next one, here's uh, on the photo in the middle of this picture, was a Dnipro Ukrainian resident uh, and he obtained a position of Minister of Public Education in the government of Ukrainian People's Republic during 1917-1919. As you know, after the First World War here in Ukraine, we have uh, the possibility to establish a national, to establish a national um, state. After the Ukrainian National Revolution failed, he moved from Cape to Lviv and became very active here as an artist. Being a chemist, Kolodny was interested in the technique issues of Ukrainian icons preserved at the National Museum. In his work, the artist was guided by ancient Ukrainian icons and frescoes. Uh, his images are symbolic and sophisticated, with an emphasized individual palette of translucent tones. His real artistic achievements can be considered his painting of the chapel at the Theological Academy, as you see uh, them or uh, inside um, this uh, chapel, they are painting. Uh, they were painting this chapel, three together. Um, uh, where symbolization reached the highest level. Admiring Polodny's work, Metropolitan Sheptyski argued he was a very great uh, connoisseur of the art and of the history of art. So he stated that abstract and symbolic art should simultaneously embody and reveal to us the beauty and meaning of the supernatural and mystical notions. And for these uh, um, ideas, the realism could not serve uh, as it's uh, evident. While Wojciech and Kolodny had different visions of the creation of modern Ukrainian religious art and quantitatively their contribution to the curating project, projects, religious art is small, then Mikhailo Osinchuk and Pavlo Kovzun managed to develop uh, a coherent style that became a kind of model for the monumental decoration of the sacred buildings in Galicia. Mikhailo Osinchuk studied at the Krakow Academy of Fine Arts with the prominent Polish artist Józef Pankiewicz, as well as uh, ancient art, art under the guidance of the art historian Jerzy Metzelski at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. In 1913-1914, he helped to supplement the National Museum's collection by acquiring items from parish church. Thus, he became well acquainted with the ancient Ukrainian icon paint. In his theoretical art uh, later, Osinchuk wrote, the icon painting corresponded to the psyche of the Ukrainian farmer on his, on his thought. In its rhythmical composition and symbolic meaning, as the peasant daily work is in a sense rhythmical. But, as Osinchuk stated further, it was impossible to transfer historical icon into an era of different people and different conditions. So he followed, I had to take just basic features of all icon, the linear, the rhythmical color movements, and the symbolic meaning of the composition itself. Through the 1920s, Ozinchuk also traveled to Greece, where he got acquainted with the technology of tempera polychrome, as well as to Italy, France, and Turkey studying Byzantine iconography and uh, mosaics. Pavlo Kovzun is known first of all as a prominent illustrator, a member of the, of the cave futurist group of artists, as he was publisher of the first avant-gardist journal Quero with Semenko brothers and the follower of the innovative art by Georgi Nargu. After moving to Lviv in 1921, Kovzun carried out a profound reform of applied graphics, 
as evidenced by his numerous book covers and designs. He has participated in international exhibitions and received several awards for his graphic works, works including exhibition in Prague, Los Angeles, and Berlin. He has worked as an editor, editor, publicist, and art, art critic as well. Both Pavlo Kurzum and Mikhail Rosinchuk fundamentally influ influenced changes in the artistic decoration of the Ukrainian church in Galicia. That great aesthetic distance between two epochs of the monumental religious art is evident on this slide. Instead of the illusionistic decoration with naturalistic settings of the 19th century historicism to the left of the picture made by Cornelius Theonovich, decoration in uh, the St. Nicholas Church in Mykolaiv, a little town uh, near the Lviv. So this 19th century historicism, these artists have turned toward the monumental stylization and the planar generalization of the new age, age of modernism. The difference for me is more than obvious. These two artists created in collaboration more than 10 monumental church decorations that demonstrated the establishment of a new way of church polychrome. Osinchuk became the author of figurative composition <clears throat> in which he managed to develop his individual approach of the monumental religious images following the, the solidity, simplicity and spirituality of the ancient Christian art. Awareness of ancient Haven rule and uh, Byzantine uh, and Byzantine art is evident in all the details of the composition and iconography of the images. However, despite the obvious borrowing of the motives, the artists do not copy but shape the contemporary artistic reality. A traveling to Italy was a turning point in the maturation of the style of monumental paintings. Of course, they uh, visited the remarkable sites of Byzantine era in Venice, Ravenna, Florence, Palermo, and Monreale. It is seen here on this slide quite evidently. But also being in the process of preparing an international exhibition in, the, in 1931 and being in the process of the modernization, not only religious artists, uh, uh, of course, but in, in general, be a modernist, um, he organized, uh, he, I mean, uh, Urzun, Pablo Urzun, uh, organized with his friend Svetoslav Burdinsky, another artist, the exhibition by uh, the Anum, means Association of Independent Ukrainian Artists, which was attended by French, Belgian, and Italian artists. So Urzun and Ursinchuk uh, visited Italy at the expense of the Metropolitan. Kovjun confirmed his assumption about the characteristic of the contemporary artistic process in Italy, modern process. He admired the intellectual pursuits and formal achievements uh, of Italian modernism, in particular Enrico Prampolini and Mario Totti, Francesco Casorati, Umberto Boccioni, and so on. About, Ferru about uh, the Ferruccio Ferrati, the, uh, the artist of Ferruccio Ferrati, Kovjun said that his sense of planes give us an gives us an example of how a work of art can be built in a certain way to achieve the effect of monumentality. The artist could compare the symbolism and laconicism of ancient art uh, with the restrained expression of plasticity of modernism. This made the images known and new at the same time. <clears throat> This slide, for example, showed, uh, show us the both, both the sources of inspiration and the way of the interpretation, especially in the mean, meaning of color. And you here have one picture which demonstrates the uh, uh, image of uh, Christ, uh, the Savior, made by, um, uh, made by uh, Usinchuk and uh, this uh, partial, this uh, ornamental parts made by uh, Kovjun. And here you can see the examples from Byzantine uh, decorations and from the decoration uh, in the Sophia in Cave, what, what was uh, rather familiar in the time for the artists. 
um, the evolution of the form and growth the confidence in mastering the means uh, the means of expression their monumentative monumentalization are visible on this slide initially as in Belena to the left the ornamentation still timidly repeats the special special dynamics of the interior and only duplicates the structural features creases wall trips pendentives etc but in later example the left one uh, the right one, sorry, uh, <clears throat> such as in the Volodymyrty village, we see an expressive plasticity that dynamized the image and makes it a more monumental and symbolic art form. According to Osinchu, instead of the local colors of the icon, he introduced a modern coloring. It's a quote now, quotation. The modeling of forms and draperies was produced by the highlights, which were carried out in white lead, but not not by taking the form uh, of three tone. Oh, sorry, not by the highlights which were carried out in white lead, like in ancient icons, but by each color plane of drapery taking the form of three tonal tonal shapes. The color arrangement of the ornamental ornamental adornment was produced in the same way. Therefore, this new polychromia of the church equally treated in the ornamental and pictorial parts had prevailing effect of a harmony of colors and values and thus evoked an exalted mood. The end of the quotation. And uh, here you see also the examples of how um, did the uh, artist inspired by the ancient icons which preserved in the museum, uh, in the National Museum in uh, Lviv. As uh, another artist, Ivan Ivanet, noticed that this, for example, in the middle, this uh, Saint uh, Mark the Evangelist could have been a prototype for the images of Mark by uh, Mikhail Orsinchuk, to the left and to the right pictures. Oh, sorry, sorry. In ornamental composition, Kovjun showed himself as a stylist, constructivist, and artist with a rich plastic imagination, imaginative thinking. He deliberately avoided any realism in the image, emphasizing decorativeness, plasticity, and symbolism. We are presented with a holistic scheme of extremely rich and complex ornamental compositions that are truly unique in every single combination. We record a great variety in details and models, in the way they are combined and presented. Sometimes it resembles the Romanesque ornaments, sometimes art deco stylization. But what is also fascinating, the coloristic, the unexpected flattering of blue, emerald, with purple, mauve, ochre, and so on in colors. And as a conclusion, we would like just stress on some ideas. We have described the revitalizing, revitalized movement to build and especially to decorate churches in the interwar period, drawing on the work of the two artists. We argue that in our opinion, both artists, Kovjun and Dusinchuk, succeeded in creating a comprehensive, coherent style of decoration. This style was based on the artistic forms of the distant and near past, the universal form of the Byzantine heritage and the national achievements in early modern art. The author of, authors of this variant of decoration were modernist artists who were not afraid to introduce experimental search into such a conservative environment as religious art. The process in general, uh, second one, the process of updating and expanding architectural religious realizations, which began at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, was interrupted by the war, since the issue of decoration was only returned to in uh, the 1920s, and it acquired different stylistic solutions. And uh, maybe perhaps we have outlined a, uh, a field for research rather than setting and uh, solving a number of tasks or questions. 
but thanks to this opportunity, the conference, the Ukrainian artistic heritage in Galicia will become more evident and understandable. And um, perhaps that is, that is <laughs> the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Oksana and Sofia. That was very interesting. And thank you very much for introducing us to this uh, exciting topic. Thank you. Um, thank to you. save some time, goodbye. And I hope to see you soon, uh, Sofia. Um, okay, bye. bye. Um, we have uh, to our next topic, um, which is from uh, Jan Randek from Prague, who sent us a, a nice video about the reconstruction of uh, the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague. Jan Randak identifies as an art historian of time history. He is director of the Institute of Czech History at the Charles University in Prague. His uh, research interests include politics of memory and occupation and design of the urban landscape. And I'm sure it's very interesting to watch this. Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, first of all, please accept my apologies for speaking to you in a pre-recorded talk. Unfortunately, I had to stay in Prague in order to attend to other work-related duties. So I am missing out on what will surely be a very interesting meeting and on your contributions, comments and discussions. However, I'm glad to be able to get involved in the conference, at least indirectly, and thereby contribute to the exchange of knowledge concerning the attractive topic of reconstruction of religious buildings in the 20th and 21st century Europe. My talk is entitled the restoration of the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague and the reconstruction of progressive national traditions in socialist Czechoslovakia. Keep in mind, however, that I'm speaking to you as a historian of contemporary history interested in the strategies and instruments of the politics of history of the Czechoslovak communist dictatorship. I'm not an architectural historian or an architect who will overwhelm you with specific information about the restoration of Bethlehem Chapel. So, what will I be talking about? First, a minor spoiler. When the Communist Party came to power in Czechoslovakia in February 1948, Numerous references to the revolutionary phases of national history began to fill Czech public space. In particular, the medieval Hussite movement, or rather what was supposed to be the Hussite tradition, was highlighted as a leitmotiv of Czech history from the 15th century to the rise of the communist dictatorship. The building of socialism was supposed to follow up on develop and complete the Hussite tradition and the communist government was portrayed as a supposedly logical conclusion of Czech history. A poster example of the entry of communist politics of history into public space is the reconstruction of the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague. Let me first give you the context in which the reconstruction should be seen. Okay. In a representative publication devoted to Prague, the Czech art historian Václav Wilhelm Stech described Prague as a faithful city of which there are not many in the world. For him, Prague in 1948 was a place embodying Czech national history and a major monument to the struggle for Czech nationhood in the distant and the near past. Of course, what he also had in mind by that was World War II, which had just ended. At the same time, however, Prague for him was a city in which a great past combined with a hurried 
present. In the new political situation after the communist takeover, Prague was to become a beautiful city in a socialist sense. It was to be turn, turned into a symbol of innovation, the cultural maturity of the state and of its people's political con uh, consciousness and progress. In the minds of political and urban planners, transforming the capital into a socialist metropolis mean, uh, meant reshaping the city structure to make it fit for the life of the new socialist human. New landmarks were to be introduced in the city. This included, this included a huge statue of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin erected between 1955 and 1962 on the Letná Hill just outside the center of Prague. The plants also involved, among other things, a new headquarters of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia and central government building. Also envisaged was the construction of a central square designed for rallies. Massive construction activity was supposed to take place, encompassing housing estates, student dorms, uh, kindergartens, etc., as well as new parks, orchards and playgrounds. Gradually, a city was to be built to suit the new vibrant socialist life within its walls. Prague, Prague thus had two faces. To the observer at the time, it was a city recovering from the war and expecting a dynamic development of its housing and transport infrastructure, amenities, and uh, recreational areas. But Prague also reminded a historic city. And this was not a problem, though. As the architectural historian Alois Kubicek argued, in the mid-1950s, in the context of monument conservation, I quote, for us, the restoration of old Prague is not just a contemporary indulgence, but a statesman, uh, state, uh, statesman-like prudence, part of the national culture and economic program, and therefore a necessity for the state. And since it is concerned with architecture, that is, the broadest and most human of the arts, the aim is to exert an immediate, consistent and lasting influence on our national pride by marking use of exemplary buildings of past ages. They give us the uh, strength to perform great feats, uh, feats in the present and future. The end of quote. To separate Prague's past from its future would simply have been misleading. The two were deeply intertwined. What Prague's socialist future was to rest on were the solid foundations of a progressive, one may even say a revolutionary historical development. Of course, there is a logic in the representatives of dictatorship emphasizing the past. Paying attention to this emphasis allows us to explore the official politics of history as exercised by those in power. Indeed, one of the main efforts of state propaganda after February 1948 was to legitimize the Communist Party's claim to power. National history also, national history also served as an important argument in the spirit of seeing the communist as here's the communist party was incorporated into continuous Czech historical narrative of the successor as a as the successor of the progressive forces and the natural outcome 
of uh, national history. In particular, a politics of history was actively pursued that emphasized Hussitism and what were supposed to be the Hussite revolutionary traditions. These were said to have stretched through Czech history over the centuries up to the communist takeover of February 1948. The medieval Hussites were presented as the forerunners of the domestic communist movement. In addition to scholarly works and political speeches, public festivities, films and literature, this idea was also developed by recording and actively reshaping public space. The reconstruction of Prague Bethlehem's chapel is a case in point here. Within the state's politics of history, Jan Hus, a Czech theologian, philosopher, church reformer and the inspiration of Hussitism became the epitome of revolutionary Hussitism. Thus, it is the importance attitude to Hussitism understood politically and revolutionary and the exclusive position of Jan Hus as a supposed medieval proto-communist that explain that explains the intention and purpose with which the Bethlehem Chapel was reconstructed between 1950 and 1952-53. In short, the Bethlehem Chapel was among the highlighted sites in Prague, interpreted as a revolutionary city. It was the place where Jan Hus, an alleged revolutionary hero, preached. The Bethlehem Chapel was described as a large gathering place for the people and as a pulpit for whose political proto-communist speeches. The Bethlehem Chapel was seen as the cradle of the revolutionary movement of the Czech people. The Bethlehem Chapel stands in Old Town, the historic center of Prague. The original building, built between 1391 and 1394, uh, was intended for Czech language preaching. Between 1402 and 1413, Jan Hus was actively there. The Gothic chapel covered an area of eight, excuse me, 800 square meters, and its capacity was estimated at up to 3,000 people. In this context, let me mention an uh, interesting calculation that was floated during the politically sensitive 1950s. I quote, it is no uh, exaggeration to say that in whose time the whole Prague, the whole Prague, which then had 50,000 uh, 50, inhabitants, would gather in the chapel. We arrive at the number of 3,000 determined, uh, determined and brave people if we exclude a large number of women, children, the aged and the sick, the Germans, uh, clergymen and other hostile elements. End of quote. In the course of history, the chapel has met with various, uh, various fates. What is important for the purpose of my talk is that uh, it was demolished in 1786 due to its poor condition. The site had, been, uh, had then been uh, abandoned for several years until a three-story apartment house was built there, in part using the original perimeter walls. This happened between 1836 and 1837. In 1919, that is after the establishment of independent Czechoslovakia, an in-depth survey was carried out in the site. It proved that part of the original uh, masonry, more precisely, more precisely three walls of the chapel, had been preserved. 
the fourth wall was known solely from all depictions and preserved only in its foundations. And then in the summer of uh, 1948, an important decision was made. At the suggestion of Zdeněk Nejedlí, the then Minister for Education and an uncritical promoter of Hussey traditions, the Czechoslovak government chose to restore the Bethlehem Chapel. Interwar Czechoslovakia had toyed with the same idea before. The initiative of Nejedlí, who was obsessed with Hussitism, was therefore not revolutionary in principle. What was ideological new, uh, ideologically new, however, was the justification for the proposal. I quote, there is certainly no need to waste words on the, impo uh, on the importance of the Bethlehem Chapel. It was one of the most important places in the history of our nation, not least because of the person of the Bethlehem preacher, master, Mr. Jan Hus, and the fact that the greatest movement of our nation to date, the Hussite movement, was born and developed here. The end of quote. The restoration of the chapel began in a ceremony in July 1950 as a part of the annual commemoration of the burning of Jan Hus in Constance in 1415. The reconstruction was headed by the Committee for the Restoration of the Bethlehem Chapel, led by the Minister Nayedli. Nayedli not only visited the site regularly. During the committee meetings, he also reminded its members of the political importance of the restoration of the chapel. This was also why the completed building was not to be lent to any church body. Although the committee oversaw organizational matters, ideological references to the Hussey tradition were on its agenda. The practical implementation of the design was handled by architect Jaroslav Fragner, one of the prominent creators of Czech interwar functionalism and modern classicism. After World War II, he, among other things, he did the Academy of Fine Arts. In addition to his teaching activities, he devoted himself to the reconstruction of historical buildings. Apart from the Bethlehem Chapel, he participated in the reconstruction of the historic home of Charles University in Prague, so-called Carolinum. The political importance of the chapel was not always taken into account in its reconstruction as the materials of the state institutions show. The situation was made more complicated by the expropriation and uh, uh, eviction of the tenants from the apartment house where the chapel was to be built. The demands for extra supplies of building materials were in conflict with the capacity of the producer and the mistress uh, harbored by ministerial officials. Demolition and construction works were also initially hampered by the lack of the supporting documents, which the committee was unable to supply in time. The chapel had been completed in the summer of, <coughs> excuse me, 1953, but its surroundings were yet to be modified. The chapel was therefore not opened until a year later. On the eve of the anniversary of Hugh's burning at the stake, 5 July 1954, a ceremony was held in Prague on Bethlehem Square. During the ceremony, the chapel was handed over to the people. One of the speakers was again Minister Nadley, who once again described the chapel as a medieval political pulpit. The interior decoration also served 
the political purpose followed by the representation. Also, the chapel was supposed to be a copy of the building in which Hus preached. At least its interior, uh, its uh, interior decoration was based on the current needs of communist politics of history. For example, the walls of the building depict historically scenes from the Hussit Wars, which took place, uh, took place many years after Hus had been burned at a stake. Thus, the figure of Jan Hus as such was less important in the reconstruction that, uh, than what was supposed to have been his message. Hus sermons mark the beginning of Czech revolutionary struggles against the feudal, uh, feudal uh, order. In the early days and weeks, the public showed a real interest, uh, interest in the chapel, at least judging by newspaper and magazine accounts and photographs of the interior of the building crowded with visitors. Some writers recounted the uh, eagerness of visitors waiting in groups before opening hours and note with understanding their dissatisfaction when the monument was not opened in time. Nevertheless, the question reminds what people felt and expected when visiting the chapel. Did they identify with the specific form of the Hussite tradition they were offered or were they driven by curiosity about the new Prague monument whose reconstruction they were continuously informed about in the pages of the press? The contemporary press, however, knew the answer. I quote, a strange feeling comes over you when you stand in the place sanctified by the feet of Hus. You leave Bethlehem Square and look back once more. Bethlehem stands here where white, shining and majestic in its simple, plain beauty. The cradle of the most glorious epoch of the, our history, the sanctuary of Hus, a place so closely linked to our national existence. Then, you step out of the quiet square into the bustle of the city. You step out to return, perhaps a year from now, at least for an hour. And don't say you've come or wandered here in by accident. You've drawn to the chapel as a son is drawn to his mother. You've come back to pay your respect and to rejoice in the glorious past of our people. And you will come again. The end of quote. However, then came the political relaxation of the 1960s, bringing a more sober view of the chapel's restoration. The building was declared a national culture monument in 1962. As a political relaxation uh, intensified in 1968, thus the building was unmasked as a, unmasked as a political act of the 1950s and as a monument which Minister Nedley created to himself. What I haven't said yet is that the interior also features a commemorative plaque with a telling inscription. Uh, I quote, to Zdeněk Nedley, the government of the Czechoslovak Republic in recognition of his services for the restoration of Bethlehem, uh, the end of quote. But the truth is that the reconstruction itself was and is generally appreciated. The architect Jaroslav Fragner sensitively returned the chapel to its assumed Gothic form without being able to draw on documents detailing its former state. As some, um, uh, as some have subsequently noted, the reconstructed facade may not be flawless. The chapel probably ori uh, originally had one extra window, but at the same time, the quality of the architectural interventions, including the newly designed windows, was regarded as very good. 
the uh, prevailing view is that the replica of the chapel has been very sensitively inserted in the space of today's Bethlehem Square. With what then can I conclude my contribution? In 1948, the new communist government decided to restore the Bethlehem Chapel in its supposedly original form. However, the chapel acquired new historical and political significance with emph uh, emphasis placed on the connection with the work of the preacher Jan Hus, automatically associated with the revolutionary Hussite movement, it was considered the, uh, it was considered the cradle of Czech revolutionary traditions. The building was open to the public for tours as a historical and political monument. Although the chapel was restored with its original walls, the political meanings and values associated with it, with it after the reconstruction actually made it a new object within a new topography of Prague, now described as a new socialist city. In short, the Bethlehem, uh, the Bethlehem's chapel inserted in the Prague space represents a political update of a specific place of memory. It became a physical object um, uh, um, uh, embodying uh, the narrative of progressive national history. The chapel therefore uh, entered uh, inter the Prague environment not as a monument turned to the past, but primarily as a living place oriented towards the future. Thank you for your attention. OK, let's um, make a bit of tempo. Um, I want to invite Professor Dr. Giedre Jankiewicz-Kutja to come here. I'll introduce her. She is an art historian and exhibition curator based in Vilnius, Lithuania. She's a leading research fellow at the Art History and Visual Culture Department of the Lithuanian Institute for Culture Research and professor of art history in Vilnius Art Academy. Her current field of interest lies in the artistic culture of occupied countries. She explores this topic focusing on the situation of Lithuania in the middle of the 20th century. And you will get some very interesting insights about modern architecture. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for introduction and uh, thank you very much. I want to express my gratitude for the organizers for yeah for the, especially for Marcus for inviting inviting me and for this possibility to be with you here. So. I will present you uh, the case study in the, of the Church of the Resurrection, which is standing in Konas, Lithuania. The church has a short but very complex uh, history. It is now a lucky, a successful case, because after various vicissitudes and dramas, now it is performing its original function. However, just from 90s, uh, although its construction began in the early 30s. The church was conceived in uh, in uh, 20s and started to be built in 30s, not only as a Catholic shrine, but also as a national monument, a votive offering for the country's independence. However, two, or if to be more precise, three waves of occupations in the mid 20th century, Soviet, Nazi, and Soviet again, changed its, its fate. The unfinished church first was turned into a warehouse by Nazis, and secondly, into a, a factory by Soviets. But let's take things one step by at a time. Uh, Konas was Lithuania's uh, 
provisorial capital during the two decades between First and Second World War. Lithuania proclaimed its independence on February 16, 1918. However, in the wars with Bolshevik Russia, country lost its historical capital, Vilnius, which became part of newly established Polish Republic. <clears throat> At the time, Kaunas was a small and modest town, a former fortress of a Russian Empire with an old town created by German merchants. Thus, turning Kaunas into the capital of the young national state was quite a big challenge. The city had to be modernized and new symbolical centers had to be formed as well. Neither the Gothic Catholic Cathedral in the old town, nor the German built late Baroque town hall, or all uh, the more the Orthodox neo Russian style garrison church, which dominated the new town, suited the purpose of embodying the symbols of statehood and nationality. From the mid uh, 1920s, the city grew and developed rapidly replacing the earlier wooden and so-called imperial brick style buildings with stuccoed apartment blocks, villas, and public buildings of modernist style. During approximately 12 years before the outbreak of World War II, 12,000 building permits were issued in Konas, a city of 19 97,000 inhabitants before World War I, Kaunas intensely expanded. Its population increased twice and the area grew almost four times. Several buildings, the National Museum, the Lithuanian Post Office, the Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Crafts, constructed during the 30s, were seen as symbols of the new era of independent state. One did not have to be a smart ideological strategist to understand that for a symbolic building to acquire an extraordinary semantic load, it had to dominate the cityscape. It is only natural that political and cultural figures thinking about national unity and patriotic education turned their gaze to Jalakalnis or Green Hill that flanked the center of the city at the east and served as a natural barrier from the northeast from the new downtown situated in the Namunas River Valley. In the eyes of the creators of the symbolic sites of Konas, the Jalakalni slope was of strategic importance at this uh, as this area could be seen from different points, not only from the city center, but also from the Namunas River and its opposite bank. Historians of architecture try to relate the Church of, Res of the Resurrection, which began to rise on the slope of Jalakalni starting from 1934, to the Stadtkrone conception by the avant-garde architect Bruno Taut. Taut hoped that modernist architecture would help to mitigate national and social differences by transforming post-war European cities. Yet the search for national identity led the architects of many young uh, countries of the interwar period and their customers in another direction. So the Church of the Resurrection was above all perceived as a germ in the crown of the young national state, the national monument rather than point of reference in the urban plan of the democratic city. The idea to build a monumental church that would symbolize the resurrection of Jesus Christ and alongside the Lithuanian nation and would become a sign of gratitude to the Lord, that means to perform the function of a religious votive, was born in 1922. There were plans to expand and deepen the symbols of Lithuania's memorial sanctuary by installing a national mausoleum for highly distinguished figures of public and national importance in the church crypt. Among the examples that inspired the initiators of uh, the Lithuanian project were the Vienna votive Kirche, 
and the Basilica of a Sacre Coeur in Paris, uh, which rose on the top of Montmartre Hill, lap, rapidly urbanized from the mid of uh, 1870s, and was meant to instill hope and confidence in the French people in the wake of the painful defeat in the war with Prussia and in the face of an incipient new war with Germany. The competition for the Church of Resurrection was announced in 1928 to mark the 10th anniversary of the state, uh, state's independence. The architects uh, had to fulfill three basic requirements. To give the sanctuary the form of a monument, to design a space for a mausoleum, and to convey the spirit of Lithuanian construction according to the tender conditions. Correspondingly, the terms of the competition included the criteria for the participants' eligibility. It was open exclusively for Lithuanian citizens, citizens of Lithuanian origin residing in foreign countries, and foreign citizens residing in Lithuania. That means those who were familiar with the aforementioned spirit, or at least were capable to feel it. The project of the third place winner, Karolis Reisonas, or Karlis Reisons in Latvian, because he was Latvian, the head of the Kunas Urban Construction Department at the time was chosen to be implemented. Rezonas was a Latvian. He got Lithuanian citizenship only in 1932 and an evangelical reformer, even if later he converted to Catholicism. These two circumstances were used as a weighty argument by the project's op opponents. Here, an analogy with the opposition against the Slovenian architect Joze Plechnik, which appeared at a similar time in Prague, unwillingly presents itself. Rezonas gave free reign to his imagination and designed a spectacular 83 meter spiral tower of reinforced concrete, which was to be crowned with a seven meter high statue of the risen Christ. The stairs on the exterior of the tower had to be decorated with sculptures and marble columns with lamps whose light would be visible from all over the city in the evening. It is obvious that the architect cast a glance at the neo-Gothic votive Kirche in Vienna and was quite likely impressed by the spiral tower of Copenhagen's Church of Our Savior. Politicians and the majority of church and public figures were fascinated by this fantasy, yet several more rationally thinking representatives of the cultural circles were opposed to this utopian proposal. The art historian Halina Kirukshita Yatsinyene even brought the opinion of her professor and the international authority on art, Heinrich Wölflin. In an attempt to persuade her compatriots that it was essential to look for a more contemporary architectural solution. Finally, the church builders got conceived, convinced that it would be difficult and perhaps even impossible to implement the intricate project that captivated their imagination, both due to its technical complexity and costliness. So, Reasoners redesigned the church. And on 21st April 1933, a project uh, of three nave basilica of clear geometrical forms with a bell tower and the chapel on a flat roof was approved. The foundations of Resurrection Church were laid in the summer of the same year, a process that according uh, to architect was truly technically challenging as it was the first attempt in the history of Lithuanian civil architecture demanding such thorough preparation. 900 concrete pylons were sunk into a sand bed for the foundation at, at a depth of uh, three and a half to six and a half meters, exhausting nearly the entire amount of funds raised uh, thus far. 
The shipment of the cornerstone from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem was equally costly. After construction stalled, fundraising efforts were renewed. Every potential supporter was given the opportunity to purchase a brick for a placement in the church walls. The campaign was a success. In the summer of 1936 alone, nearly 150,000 liter, uh, 50, liters, equivalent of more than half of a million of euros of today, were raised, while more affluent donors extended zero interest loans for the construction. Till 1940, two thirds of the construction costs were funded by public donations and the remainder from the government. The ceremony of laying the cornerstone of the church was planned to coincide with the first National Eucharistic Congress that took place in the summer of 1934. In 1936, the walls were built. Uh, in 1938, the roof was treated with concrete and a bell tower began to rise. In 1939, two staircases leading to the roof were built, oak window frames adapted for stained glasses were installed, the talented young local artists were commissioned to create stained glasses and negotiations for their production were started with Franz Meyer workshop in Munich. Plaster work on the church exterior was not begun before the Soviet occupation, which started on 15 of June 1940. From 1940, the temple, which was conceived as the monument to Lithuanian independence, unexpectedly turned into a symbol of the loss of statehood. The Soviets nationalized the unfinished building in 1941. A year later, the Nazis converted it into a paper storage. In 1952, the church was adapted for the needs of a Soviet military complex and produced radio equipment for Soviet tanks and later also TV sets for the civil needs. On the top of the bell tower, uh, you can see uh, the letters uh, uh, KPSS uh, in Cyrillic, uh, the abbreviation for Communist Party of Soviet Union. In the process of creating the manufacturing facilities, the space of the church was partitioned with concrete um, slabs between the floors. Uh, and the redundant chapel on the terrace was pulled down. Equipment was installed in the newly formed production departments uh, and auxiliary premises as design department and other buildings were constructed in the churchyard. The radio factory was one of the reasons why the Soviet administration turned Kaunas into a so-called closed city where foreigners were not allowed. The political postcard uh, by Italian Christian Democrats from the 60s uh, states that it never should happen to the Basilica of Sant'Andrea in Vercelli, Piemonte, what happened to the Church of the Resurrection in Conas under the communist regime. As the first signs of imminent fall of the Soviet regime appeared in 1988, Demands were voiced to move the factory out of the building. Uh, here is the photo uh, with uh, the brick church and the statue of Lenin in, in the square. Uh, so the demands uh, were voiced to move the factory out of the building and to return the church to believers. The massive red brick structure dominated the Kaunas cityscape for 50 years as a reminder of the unfinished construction of a national symbol and the aim of the restoration of independence. It was not until the early 21st uh, century that the church was plastered white after having been returned to the Catholic Church. 
The reconstruction was finished in 2004, according to the project of the renowned Kaunas based architect Antanas Elgimantes Sprindis. A chapel dedicated to the Our Lady of Shulova was installed again on the flat roof and a columbarium was established in the church basement to honor the remains of those who had served to the church, nation and state. The basement also now includes meeting and funeral rooms. A parish hall was completed on the southwestern side of the church in 2009. The decoration of the church is still unfinished. There was a long dispute over the nature of the decor, as no original design or sketches, not even contracts with the artist, remained. Most of those who had been negotiated for the Resurrection Church left for the West at the end of the war. Only a few years ago did the correspondence between Casis Vernalis, one of those artists, and the rector of the Church of the Resurrection on the design of its decoration first in the DP camps in Germany, then in Chicago, where they both emigrated, come to light. Uh, the correspondence uh, constantly expressed the hope that after a few years, the Soviets would be defeated and it would be possible to resume the construction, furnishing and decoration of the church upon their return to Kaunas. The wait lasted 50 years. The history of the church has given it a new symbolism. The Church of the Resurrection became the largest and most visible monument to Lithuania's independence in our days. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for this exciting uh, exploration of a very uh, different religious building from all the other buildings we've seen so far. Thank you very much for that. And also the relation, of course, with uh, national identity and uh, the recovery of that. It's very interesting. Are there any questions in the room? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very interesting talk. And you, you have mentioned that wood for this church was brought from Jerusalem. Is it correct? The cornerstones. But if, if there was any reference to the biblical temple in the time of construction of this church, because you mentioned it was not just a symbol of Catholicism, but for the nation. So uh, is in, in that time of construction of the church, did, in public discourse, uh, they draw this parallel with the building of the Temple of Jerusalem for Jewish people. No. Yeah, but it's common. Uh, there is no benefit of Christianity in Judaism. No, no not this. Thank you. Yes. Main material of construction was it brick or steel or concrete? No, brick. Brick. Okay. And when it was then uh, put, when the plaster was put on and it turned white, I mean, the whole ex expressiveness changed radically. Was there opposition to keep it in brick? Everyone was happy to get the orange. <laughs> And did I see it right? There was a there is a chapel on top of the roof, and and in front of the chapel is a flat area where a, a huge terrace. <laughs> it's uh, very unusual. Yeah. Yes. Ah, Anneli has also a question. Thank you. It was really, really inspiring. Uh, I was looking at the initial uh, design by Karolis Reisona uh, with a spiral, and that reminded me of the constructionist uh, architecture of the 1920s Russia, rather Tatsintal and, and things like that. Uh, was there a, 
has it been discussed like this? Was it, a, uh, you, you mentioned that there were discussions about this design being too, too complex and, and anyway, impractical, but was there any hint on it being uh, related to the Russian architecture of, of the time or not really? Yeah, that, that's why why I thought it was so interesting because it, it obviously reminds of it and uh, but it, it was a uh, a really national monument and and it was meant to be a national monument so the discrepancy between these two things is interesting isn't it? okay thank you okay um also some questions in the chat maybe no okay well let's have a coffee break then and um Oh, everybody is relieved here. <laughs> and after that, we go to Mario Bach with his very interesting. Uh, okay. Okay, so we are back uh, with our new session. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Mario Bach. He has a degree in Germanic philology and holds a doctorate from the University of Ghent in uh, specializes in tiles. He is an expert in tiles and uh, the Tiles and Architectural Ceramics Society. He teaches um, heritage studies at the University of Antwerp and art history at the University of Ghent. So welcome, Mario. Thank you, Marcus, for the introduction. In my presentation, I will leave the city context of the former presentations and focus on a small village in uh, Flanders. Uh, and I uh, will focus in my presentation on the cases of um, the small parish church in Onze Lieve Vrouw Waver, which was enlarged just before the First World War and demolished during the First World War and then rebuilt. Uh, and I will focus on the discussions, the aesthetic uh, choices which were made uh, by uh, architects and uh, the controlling uh, institutes uh, about the church. Okay. Onze Livre-Auer is, a, as I said, a small village in Flanders in Belgium. It's situated between Antwerp and Brussels and close to uh, the city of uh, Mechelen, uh, it, but it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, uh, now it uh, has about uh, 6,000 uh, inhabitants. At uh, around 1900, it had 3,000 inhabitants. And now it is famous for the Institute of the Ursulines with the uh, Art Nouveau Winter Garden and of course also for uh, the Paris church. Uh, uh, yeah. The Paris was founded in 1216 uh, the, with a Romanesque bell tower uh, remains from that period and some decorative elements remain also. In the uh, 14th and 15th century, a new high choir in Gothic style was uh, uh, Edit and replacing, and now he is running automatically. The PowerPoint is running automatically. Yeah. Okay. It replaced the Roman Esquire. It was before 1600, a very important center of pilgrimage to Our Lady. Uh, lead pilgrimage tokens were found uh, in the city uh, of Mechelen, uh, which means that a lot of people came on pilgrimage to that uh, small village. That's the reason why a Romanesque uh, tower and a Gothic choir could be paid uh, in that uh, small village. 
In the 18th century, uh, there was added a Baroque bell tower to plans of the then uh, well-known architect uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, de Way. Uh, and the church had its general view from 1780 until 1911 as a simple building with that dominant Baroque uh, bell tower. In 1907, many interior elements in the church are described as very valuable in an official art inventory by the archaeologue Fernand Donnet. Uh, and it was published in a, a huge series of books uh, which made an inventory not only of the big churches in Flanders, but also of smaller uh, villages. Then the consciousness grew uh, that also in villages there was important religious uh, heritage elements to be found. In the church were three Baroque altars for Our Lady, the Holy Trinity and St. Anthony Abbot. There were also a few paintings, a few sculptures, and a splendid Baroque pulpit made by a famous uh, Mechelen uh, artist. The gradual growth of the population around 1900 uh, led to local demands for a new and larger church building, as realized in some neighboring countries. Uh, the church had 568 square meters and could then only accommodate a maximum of 1,000 people, while there were then uh, approximately 3,000 inhabitants, so the need was uh, great, big. In August 1907, Edward Carrales was provincial architect responsible uh, for supervising all uh, official buildings in the province of Antwerp, and he was asked to make a proposal. He was born in Lier, employed as a carpenter, and uh, took his uh, training at the Royal Academy uh, in Antwerp, where he took courses from uh, a well-known, uh, in Belgium, well-known provincial architect, Josef Schade, the city architect of Antwerp, uh, Peter Dens, and the famous architect publicist in Brussels, Auguste Schwa. And he graduated in 1879 with a Premier Prix d'Excellence, the first prize for excellence. He was the premier of his uh, generation at the Antwerp Academy, which meant something in Belgium and also in Europe. In preparation of the restoration of the uh, Vimaris Church in Lier, Carreels made a preliminary study, which was published in Lirana and in the well-known architectural uh, uh, journal, Emulation, and he prefers the reconstruction of the previous state, very important in the discussion of unification of style or not, uh, uh, which we know from Violet Le Duc's uh, writings. Carrel's advice for Lear is not followed, but it gives us a background of his view on uh, restoration uh, for uh, the case of Onze Lieve Vrouw First question was, are we going to demolish the church completely or are we going to enlarge the building? The governor requests advice from the Royal Commission of Monuments in Brussels on this question. The committee wished that both options, enlargement or uh, um, uh, building a new church were uh, elaborated in two sketches or two preliminary designs, but uh, Canon Joseph Laden and Fernand Donnet from the provincial uh, committee advised preservation of the tower and the right cross ale. Some fellow members of the provincial committee were also in favor to retain, for retaining the choir and the left transepts. Um, yeah. Much different opinions, that's quite uh, clear. On demand of Carrales, a photographic survey was made uh, by Prosper Morens, a photographer of Mechelen, four photos of the exterior and five of the interior that document the preliminary building history research. The pillars of the main ale, and if you look at the photo, you don't see anything, but if you look closer, you see that one of uh, the pillars has been stripped, and if we look at the detail, there are visible traces of the original uh, Gothic leafwork uh, still in place and still uh, visible under uh, the covering of the Baroque period. 
one of the four pillars of the Romanesque bell tower has also been stripped. And uh, that uh, shows traces of the original vault rips of uh, the 13th century. That leads uh, uh, for Karel, that brings Karels to plead for a respectful extension according to the most modern views concerning the enlargement of rural churches as expressed by first the Belgian art critic Emile Gevaert, who presents the ideas of the architect, denkmalpfleger und Bauschriftsteller Robert Ludwig Arns, born in Köln. Ludwig Arns uh, published the, his ideas über die Erhaltung und Erweiterung unserer Landkirchen in das Zeitschrift für christliche Kunst in uh, 1895. And his ideas were brought by Gevaert to the Belgian public and it is Karels who picks one of his ideas because based on his building research, Karels' proposal is conceived to prefer the maximum of the original building, the choir, the tower, the central ale, one side ale and the two transepts, one of which will be uh, advanced. So it will be broken down and rebuilt. Uh, the hidden authentic elements uh, and some, there are more hidden elements he discovered, uh, he will expose again. And this plan follows example neuf uh, by Arns in his publications. And you can see in blue the existing older parts and in red all the new parts on the plan of Karels, which gives a, a rather um, difficult plan uh, uh, with two main ales uh, close to each other. On, in January 1908, the designs are, approval, are approved by the Royal Commission in Brussels after discussing whether it was not advisable to demolish the, the Baroque bell tower and replace it with a more suitable etage romain avec couverture du même style. So unification of style or not, uh, the conclusion is uh, we will keep uh, the Baroque bell tower because the local people uh, like uh, the visible uh, history of the building to be retained. The maximum preservation of artistic and historical val valuable parts are so combined with a new uh, aspect of the church. All smaller elements uh, uh, Karels could find were uh, reintegrated uh, in the building. He takes also the opportunity to create a neo-Gothic ensemble uh, because uh, there was also a local little school and a town hall, and there was also the presbytery. And uh, Karels takes the opportunity to rebuild the entirety of the central site, uh, complete restyling of the uh, existing presbytery parsonage uh, and a completely new neo-Gothic town hall, clearly inspired what uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste de Bethune, who was also active here in Aachen in the Dome Chapel, uh, created around the 1860s in Vive Capelle uh, near Damme. The start of the enlargement works was in April 1910. The completion of the enlargement uh, was uh, two years later in March, March 1912, so two years before the First World War broke out. And the church interior after the uh, enlargement in 1912 allows clearly much more natural light into the building. And then we have August 1914, German invasion of Belgium, the, vi the village. The village is close to the art outer cycle of fortresses protecting the harbor city of Antwerp. Uh, you have two lines of fortresses which protected Antwerp and we are very close with Onze Lieve Vrouwen to the outer circle of fortresses. Uh, that means that in September uh, 1914, heavy shelling of the villages uh, demolishes uh, nearly uh, the complete uh, site uh, and only the walls are uh, standing. The complete interior uh, has disappeared. And I give some images. That's the central nave. 
1915, they start with the first cleaning up works under the supervision of the Reverend uh, Simons. In 1915, the Municipal Council uh, tries to um, think and start rebuilding works or restoration works, but they uh, stop uh, them and um, they wait until the First World War has ended and they restart the reconstruction works in 1919. Uh, there were, were some elements still in situ, like uh, the uh, Holy Trinity altar in artificial stone, but that was because of bad weathering become too fragile and needed to be uh, made anew. In 1919, the, the village was uh, recognized as uh, part of the destroyed regions of Belgium, which gave much more money uh, from uh, uh, for uh, restoration works in September 1919, and all is well detailed in the local church archives with uh, every uh, element documented. Carreels is appointed anew as the supervisor of the construction works by the municipal counting uh, council meetings in 1919. The reconstruction will be executed according to the four first plans, uh, the plans from 1910, 1912, with one exception, uh, namely that the burnt out roof of the old Romanesque tower, which was in conflict with the style of the construction, the new construction, of course, will be replaced with a simple spindle in the style of the tower. And you see uh, that indeed uh, it is now more logical uh, aesthetic uh, unity uh, that was uh, created. The commission, uh, the provincial commission, uh, uh, <laughs> strangely enough, stated that the dome tower, which was completely has disappeared and demolished, should, re should, should be reconstructed. And now it's the Royal Commission in Brussels who doesn't agree. agree. The local um, priest uh, asked even that the Romanesque bell tower should be demolished because he wanted a better view towards the altar. Uh, and you see in the correspondence, all discussions, it's very fascinating to see that in detail. Um, and then the rebuilding works start in 1921. Everything is kept uh, like it was in 1912. Uh, and we see that the reconstruction according to the pre-war plans uh, has been realized and finished in November 1922. And I will show you now a few elements. Uh, um, elements were added by the family of the sculptures Gerrits, uh, a new uh, Holy Trinity altar, identical to that of 1912, new Holy Sacrament altar in changement uh, to the Baroque altars, uh, a new Our Lady altar, uh, a new St. Lucia and St. Anthony altar, replacement of the 18th century Baroque pulpit by one in a neo-Gothic style, replacement of the stages of the cross in cast artificial stone, the Pieta in artificial stone. Then uh, the wooden structures were made by uh, Henri Maas, um, confessionals in neo-gothic style now, oops, never mind, new fresco, decorative paintings, and burn paintings and sculptures were also replaced by items then available on the Belgian antique market, uh, one Pieta after Hannibal Caracci, one uh, St. John the Baptist after Paolo Veronese, uh, and then to uh, painting and a sculpture to St. Anne, uh, an or a new organ, uh, new uh, bell, bells in the tower, uh, and after completion of the building works, a new church consecration rite was considered necessary uh, because the church was completely uh, demolished. In uh, 1981, uh, the church was partly protected as a monument uh, so the Romanesque and Gothic parts of the church were then considered. And uh, based on my uh, study, which was published in 2003, uh, the consciousness grow, grow that this was a unique example of a village church uh, where you can see that around 1900, the consciousness 
uh, of the Belgian uh, boards which were concerned with protecting monuments was also becoming aware of the importance of uh, those elements in a little village like Onze Lieve Vrouw Waver. I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for this uh, excellent exploration of this topic, uh, Mario Bach. Thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, in the chat? No? Are there any questions? Well, we, we can have a little discussion later on. Okay, uh, the next uh, presentation today, I hope it's ready. Yes. Is Budapest, yes. Hello, Budapest. Um, our next presentation is by uh, Isabel Urban. She's an architect specialized in uh, preservation of built heritage. And she is currently engaged in research on sacral architectural and monument preservation tendencies in Hungary from the interwar period until now. Her scientific, scientific works observe the restoration, reconstruction, contemporary usage, transformation, or in certain cases, new utilization of the ecclesiastical architectural works. I'll hand it over to you in Budapest. Welcome, every colleagues, and thanks uh, for Marcus for inviting me. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I got the flu, so uh, uh, I hope my voice will be better with microphone than without it. Uh, I have made some modifications uh, on the thematic of my presentation following the conference. Uh, thus, uh, yeah, I hope you see it. Uh, thus, in the first part of the presentation, I will talk about the interior design effects of the theological change in liturgy, and uh, then in the second part about the presentation of church ruins and their reconstruction methods in Hungary. I try to down the Zoom meeting. Yeah. In Hungary, after World War II, in the new political environment, uh, mostly the churches remained under, on, uh, under care of uh, the church. Uh, in the life of the Catholic Church, the Second Vatican Council represented a real turning point in terms of the relationship with the state, the life of faith, and the protection of sacred monuments. By the mid 1960s, the situation of small scale village churches had improved thanks to the political circumstances, the reorganization of the institutional heritage protection system and uh, to national regional research and restoration programs. By this time, institutional heritage management uh, appeared in the Hungarian church. According to that, it was essential to consider and take care of the liturgical space. Thus, within a short period of time, large number of valuable buildings have undergone centrally supervised and comprehensive restoration. Nagy Börzsöny was an important location in the period where two medieval churches were completely restored based on archaeological research between 1966 and 1967. The liturgical reform of the Second Vatican Council was so a crucial turning point because the interior of each Roman Catholic church underwent some minor or major alteration. Vatican II didn't deal with the liturgy, ecclesiastical art, or even church architecture in detail. Therefore, we cannot consider it closed in terms of content. Meantime, theological thinking of Roman Catholic liturgy has changed in significant directions. Two liturgical trends developed from the fruitful debates of the 90s, which could be simplified as the ways of community and worship. 
the former corresponds to the Vatican liturgy, the later to the Tridentine Mass. Since 2007, with Pope uh, approval, the pre-Vatican II Roman Missal can be used freely and the old ceremony can be performed again. Thus, church spaces have been faced with a very complex requirement. With this, the Pope dedicated that the two forms of the Roman rite must coexist even in the same church. One of the greatest challenges of sacral architecture is to develop a model of a church that meets to both uses of space. The purist and later didactically explanatory approach of the practice of monument protection, which was widespread at the end of the 19th century, was replaced by the reductive tendencies of nowadays. The striving for former simplicity and simplification, which is becoming common in architecture, has reached historical church spaces. It is important to emphasize the common point of view between the two different points of view. Both monument protection and the church typically reject our rising and hypothetical purism protect tradition, but nevertheless acknowledge and support the possibility of development. Beyond the intention of protecting existing past values, there is a fundamental parallel between the Hungarian approach to monument protection and the demand for modernity in the Charter of Venice and the reform efforts of the Second Vatican Council aimed at confirming to the present times. Regarding both documents, we can talk about theoretical aspirations, and there is no mention of feasibility in practice. The visual aesthetic appearance of the space was determined by the professional skills and decisions of the architect. Successful transformations can be achieved primarily by the well-functioning institutional and organizational structure and also through effective communication between professionals and the church, as well as with the cooperation of well-trained professionals. The transformation of the Benedictine Pannonhalma Archabbey started a dangerous trend in the management of the interiors of listed churches, against the sinking towards the less radical, more organic development in the theology. In my view, a uh, distinction must be made in the process of renovating liturgical spaces used by uh, monastic communities and those used by lay uh, communities, both in terms of uh, functional space layout and architectural aesthetics. In case of the monastic communities, the layout of the church developed in the direction of the communi communio space. In contrast, the space used by lay communities, the traditional longitudinal layout retained. While the members of the monastic community are theologically highly educated, with a deeper understanding the development of the liturgy, lay faithful have different experiences and pastoral guardians is more important for them. The needs of the monastic and the lay communities are both uh, present in the St. Joseph Kalazantius Chapel of the Pieris Secondary School in Budapest. The building, which includes the chapel and the sacral space, was uh, severely damaged during World War II. Following 20th century renovations providing temporary solutions, the complete renovation and reconstruction of the Pieris Center was finished in 2011. Looking at the entire space of the chapel in relation to the historic presentation and the contemporary architecture, the historical framework incorporates the new elements proportionally. From a historical point of view, the purist interventions of the 19th century can be regarded as rude in the eyes of today's monument protection, as the practice developed in relation to the historicizing works of this period. In 2023, the city of Veszprém shares the title of European Capital of Culture with the Bakony Balaton region. In this context, 
18 buildings in West Prim will be renovated between 2020 and 25. And one of the first elements uh, of this uh, is the Cathedral of St. Michael. The oldest foundations of the church debate from uh, 1030 and 40, and several Romanesque and Gothic elements can be identified in the building of the cathedral. Like the Pannonhalm Arch Abbey, this cathedral underwent a major renovation in the early 20th century with the construction of historicizing architecture incorporating Romanesque and Gothic forms. If we look toward more distant periods, the antique value of the works is increasing, so it is always the most recent period that is the victim of uh, reductive transformations. While the formation of the center in the monastic spaces is completed in terms of floor plan, the more hierarchical, devotional nature of the liturgy remains stronger in the parish churches in the Roman Catholic liturgy. Minimalist forms and visuals are more situated to the more abstract contemplative mindset of uh, monastic spaces. In a parish church, the same aesthetic provokes strong resistance from the majority of the faithful. Teaching in pictures and its visualization are an integrated part of the historical tradition of Roman Catholic church spaces. The conflict between the arguments of the art historians and the architects, as well as the community, is still determined by the religion value system uh, by uh, Regal. The opposition of uh, past values, antique, historic, and memory values, and the present values like utility value and artistic value. In the first decades of the post-World War II anti-clerical and then secularized environment, historical and sacral artworks received little support. The church focused more on the preservation of its existing sacral heritage. Apart from the organized and coordinated restoration of buildings damaged during World War II, the complete reconstruction of destroyed sacral monuments with the exception of a few monuments of national importance, was not typical in Hungary. The common practice of the period was rather a contemporary rehabilitation and adaptation, where new elements were added to the destroyed parts. Only slightly damaged parts were rebuilt or reconstructed. A nice example of 10th century reconstructions is the Church of St. Peter and Paul the Apostle in Varaso, uh, which was built in line with the international heritage preservation trends of the time. The reconstruction of the destroyed parts was based on scientific research without any hypothetical additions. Since the early 1960s, a lot of buildings have been restored following the same professional principles over a few decades. There are hundreds of medieval ruins in Hungary and a significant part of the ruins are slowly fading churches and uh, monasteries. The so-called Romvandor program, uh, we can translate it as ruin wayfarer, launched to keep these monuments alive. The interventions are basically conservations and uh, in the lack of authentic sources, reconstruction is not the aim of these interventions. Uh, in 2022, the visitor center of the renovated church ruins of Tuk was inaugurated. The community of the village donated historically valuable stones, including the gateposts placed at the corners of the uh, perimeter around the ruin. The artificial stone bench in the church interior was made by using stones collected nearby. The Köves church ruin in Oszófő was conservated in 2023 uh, in uh, this way. It took more than a year to reinforce the remaining stone walls, the carved entablier and the plaster surfaces and questionable parts of the co uh, conservation works carried out in the 1960s were adjusted. 
a special case of ruin conservation task related to the churches in the development uh, of the Moik Komadul Hermitage for tourism purposes. In Moik, the former church stood in the middle of the hermitage where the monks gathered for common prayer every three hours. During the 18th century and the 19th century, the church uh, deteriorated rapidly and only its tower and a small part of its nave remained. The remaining crypt was excavated and made visible for the public. We can find examples for conservation of ruined uh, churches free, uh, these days. This summer, uh, the reconstruction of the church ruins of Kisdörgice was completed, which is a fine example of professional researcher designer cooperation. Several church ruins of medieval origin have survived from the area of the former free settlements. In the 1960s, the state monument protection ensured the preservation of the church remains as far as possible. Today, due to the desolation of the environment, amortization has accelerated. The researchers and designers have reconstructed the former mass of the building based on the remaining walls and carved stones, historical sources and visual representations. While the aim of the preservation works in the 20th century was the conservation, this current restoration, similarly to the church in Varaso, aims to receive, uh, revive a functioning sacral building that evokes the medieval past. During the reconstruction works, only those parts were rebuilt, which was known with certainty. It is important to note that uh, this was a less unique medieval church ruin in the area, but more typical and simpler monument of the period. In recent years, our sacred monuments of national importance have not been affected by large scale, complete reconstruction ideas in the practice of heritage development. On the last few slides, I would like to mention an ongoing architectural design tender for one of the most famous monuments uh, of the Hungarian sacral heritage. A stone church uh, already stood in the area in the middle of the 11th century, then in the uh, 11th, 20s, late Romanesque, early Gothic basilica was built on the site of the church and the monastery was built connected to it. In uh, 1763, the building complex suffered several earthquake damage because completely, uh, be uh, and became completely unusable and then abandoned. The building stones were reused in construction works uh, in the surrounding area and the remains were not noticed until the 1870s. The significance of the ruins is not only architectural historical, but also an important milestone in the institutionalization of uh, monument protection. In 1889, uh, internationally well-known conservation works took place, and uh, in 1934, extensive archaeological research was carried out. The purpose of the tender is to create, I quote, to create a tourist complex uh, that includes the construction of a modern visitor center, the reconstruction of the basilica, and the construction of the Premontre Monastery. Uh, the Hungarian government expressed uh, in a decree that it agrees with increasing the share of cultural tourism in connection with the development of the Premontre Church and Monastery in Zsambik, and therefore supports the preparation of the church improvements. The announcement was uh, preceded by a thorough architectural history and building research. Since the 19th century, many prominent uh, professionals researched the building. So now the most modern surveys and diagnostic tests of the present time could be carried out uh, on these bases. At the same time, the Hungarian National Committee of ECOMOS uh, has drawn attention to the danger of full development. 
The committee review of the submitted plans took place just uh, last week. Uh, so far, the result and the direction or actual possibility of moving forward uh, are not yet known. Well, uh, we are uh, eagerly awaiting the latest news about the tender and the next moves. Thank you for your attention. I want to know these uh, reconstructed and repaired churches, are they only used for tourist or representative uh, reasons or are, is there also worship going on? Uh, some of Service. them uh, are also used for worship. Uh, the Kisdörgice uh, and the Varaso, uh, the, these small scale uh, parish churches, yes, they use them. Good, any other questions in the chat maybe? No? Oh. I was expecting uh, someone said, okay, then we go over to the other Dr. Orban. And uh, she is uh, head and research and information department of uh, on antisemitism in Hessen at the University of Marburg. And I think uh, the great accomplishment that she's involved in is uh, making sure that the Jewish heritage inspired worms and minds was inscribed as UNESCO World Heritage. A big applause for that. So thank you so much for having me here. And uh, my gratitude goes out to the organizers that my paper was accepted. And thanks especially for Marcus for his patience and um, yeah, my patience with all my emails and questions. <laughs> no? Oh, okay. 1000 years of Jewish history, resilience, persecution, destruction and reconstructions are mirrored in the decent but innovative structures of the Worms Synagogue. The Worms Jewish community was part of the Kehilot Shum, a Jewish community union between the 10th century and the destruction during the Black Death pogroms around 1349. Shum consisted of three communities alongside the Rhine and Speyer, Worms and Mines that formed the acronym Shum. Shum was the cradle of, of Ashkenazic Jewry and still has a special status and reputation in the Jewish world. The synagogue's architecture, uh, the women's uh, prayer rooms, the cemeteries and the monumental ritual baths shaped architecture in Jewish communities from Regensburg over Prague to Krakow. Rabbis, scholars, religious poetry and halachic decisions from Shum had and still have a huge impact on the Jewish world. Its lit liturgies are sung and recited in synagogues around the globe just yesterday on Yom Kippur. Since 2021, the Shum sites are inscribed as UNESCO World Heritage. The Worms Synagogue, which we see here in the, 1920, in, in the 1920s, is with view to the reconstruction after the Holocaust, after the ones of the 11th, the 14th and twice in the 17th century after crusades, pogroms and wars, a post-traumatic space. In 1034, the first synagogue in Worms was built, as we know from the surviving founder's inscription. After the crusades destructions of 1096 and 1146, it was rebuilt in 1174-75 on the same venue partly on the old foundation of 1034. This renewal and reconstruction meant also resilience because the community insisted on staying there. The men's prayer hall in Worms from the 12th century was the first two-span synagogue in Ashkenaz, with a bima placed between two columns dividing the inner space. It was an archetype for medieval synagogues such as Regensburg, Vienna, Prague, Budapest, and Krakow. The first known women's hall, Frauenschul, separated from the men's compartment by a wall with listening windows, was built in 1213. The remains of the already diminished wall between the two parts were torn down in the 19th century. Built separate, separately in the 17th century with an own entrance, 
but nestled to the men's synagogue was the so-called Rashi Yeshiva, a room for learning, for learning and debating, named after Rashi from Troyes, who studied in Shum in the 11th century. A community building was added in the 14th century, a footnote, after in the 1870s, 1870s, an organ was implemented and the wall between the women's and the men's department were removed, a small number of Jews decided to erect an Orthodox synagogue 50 meters opposite the medieval building. But high holidays and other services still brought the community together in the time or not a synagogue. In November 24, 1924, a Jewish museum was opened in a room above the women's, above the women's shul. The community in Worms inherited some of the eldest Judaica in Germany. Isidor Kiefer, please remember his name. Deputy head of the community was the museum's initiator. The exhibition reflected that the synagogue in Worms was a space of identity for the community. Kiefer, who emigrated 1933, stated, each and every precious object has its heartfelt connection with the community of Worms. Each piece recalls its, joy, its joys and sufferings, its decline and its ascent, each piece conveying Worms history and Worms culture. In 1934, the Worms synagogue looked, looked back to 900 years of history and numerous letters streamed in from Jewish communities and organizations from Budapest to New York. They, they mirror what the community meant to the Jewish world. The Jewish community Braunschweig wrote, if in such an earnest era, your honorable community will commemorate 900 years of existence of the house of prayer, the, fest the festivity will have its impact beyond your community. It is, it is as, at once a commitment to our Judaism and a serious statement of our rooting in German soil and culture. Rabbi Leo Beck, as head of the Jewish communities in Germany, underlined in Worms, nine centuries, this means nobility. Nine centuries of such a house of prayer also means fatherland. A covenant was created between this space and fatherland, between home country and spirituality. This is the Jewish Worms, and this is the haunting imperative, unity, solidarity, and the determination to unify. This is the spirit of Worms. And this was 1934. Anti-Semitism, expulsion, and persecution emerged at every corner. When the wave of destruction against synagogues and the Jewish population swept through Germany and Austria, since November 9, 1938, the Worms synagogue was set on fire two times, once in, ex extinguished by members of the Jewish community. They were pushed aside and the male Jews deported to concentration camps. Lost was the synagogue, including the Baroque interior, lost were Torah scrolls, furniture, the museum, and most of its objects. After autumn 1939, the remaining walls and entrances were intentionally collapsed using a, a, a hydraulic press. As the rubble was piling high, covering in some parts around 1.40 meters of remaining walls, some of the original building material, including ornamental fragments, entrance portals, or inscriptions, were rescued. Here the city archivist, Dr. Friedrich Maria Illert, steps into the picture. In November 38, the community archive, the Wormsmachsor, a prayer book from the 13th century, not placed in the museum, but in a community safe, were confiscated by the Gestapo and transferred to a state archive. Illert was successful in returning all this to Worms. But why? Immediately after the pogrom, the archivist put many efforts in saving ritual objects, architectural fragments, the community archive, everything he was able laying hands on. The image he, he formed about himself post Holocaust depicts him as the savior of the splendid Jewish past in Worms. Illard's image of the medieval city of Worms was rooted in the 19th century glorif glorification of the Middle Ages. And he took also advantage of the Nazi regi regime's politics of history for his ambitious rise, as he was announced head of the Communal Cultural Institutes in 1934, a position he held until his retirement in 1957. For Illard and his medieval glorifying perspective, it was not the Jews as people who completed the picture, but monuments and papers. 
While he tried to secure the Jewish past through stones and objects, Jews in 1942 and 43 were gathered in a community building around the corner of the destroyed synagogue. From there, they were deported and Illard never found one personal word for what happened to the over 400 Jews of Worms murdered in camps. After 1945, Illard acted as a curator of monuments and Jewish objects. He built up his reputation primarily on the fact that, that, that he made use of his commitment in a combination of truth and legend. In 1945, the Jewish community in Worms was extinct. Between six to 10 Jews of formerly 1100 returned to Worms or still lived there. At the same time, American Jewish soldiers, Jewish displaced persons, and then staff from the Jewish Cultural Re Reconstruction and Restitution Organization started to visit, to visit the, the sites and with them, Hannah Arendt as representative of the aforementioned organization came. Reports were published mainly in journals of Jewish survivors where the destruction and the importance of the, of the Jewish past of Worms and Warsaw were connected to show the European dimension of the Holocaust. Illard followed his aims to rebuild the synagogue out of the rubble already in 1945 and started to communicate it to communicate with Isidore Kiefer, now living in New York. There is no proof that Illard and Kiefer, and Kiefer knew each other before 1933. And the quote from Illard underlines that he defined himself as a trustee for the Jewish history in Worms. The wall around the remains was constructed only in 1949 after a visit by representatives of the Jewish restitution organizations who reported that nothing had been done to preserve the ruins or protect the historical tombstones on the cemetery. In 1949, Illard rebuilt on his own the entrance portal of the men's synagogue with original material. He had no order to do this from anyone. Kiefer enthusiastically took up Illard's idea of reconstruction. Kiefer at the age of 74, missed his beloved hometown and was grateful to reconnect. Parallel to this quite odd collaboration, a debate on the remaining objects, the documents and the Worms Machsor started. JDC and Hannah Arendt tried to transfer the movable, the movable Jewish objects as ownerless Jewish property to Israel. Illard refused and threatened to dig out all gravestones in case the movable objects would be sent away to send them also overseas. The ownerless property was a crucial point in the whole debate. This open legal question had to be settled before federal or national entities were ready to engage in the synagogue's reconstruction or to provide resources. Israel needed to know that the objects would be secured and safe in a Jewish surrounding. Then Israel would also agree to the reconstruction and was dedicated to convince the Jewish community of Mainz as owner of the Jewish sites in Worms to vote also for the reconstruction. In contrast to this, Illard and Kiefer held the opinion that the Jewish community of Worms was still existent through those living in exile. They then attempted to obtain the consent of exiled Jews of Worms to postulate in their name the ongoing existence of the Jewish community and thus to demand the objects in the city and to start the synagogue's re reconstruction. Kiefer then started an appeal in mid-1955 using a form created by Illard. While few exiled Jews from Rome, from Rome signed the letter in favor of the synagogue's reconstruction, all of them deleted the sentence that they claimed to be members of the Worms Jewish community. Dr. Isaac Holzer, rabbi in Worms up to 1935, referred in his letter to Illard to the general mood in Jewish communities towards Germany. Holzer asked fellow emigrants how they felt about the question of restoring the Worms synagogue and, quote, everywhere I received the counter question, if the needy living Jews are already all taken care of. The objection is indeed understandable, as little as the historian and monument keeper may like to hear it, end of quote. Also reminded Illard also that Cornelius Heil from the prominent family in Worms, who had been a known and devoted Nazi, could be asked to pay for the reconstruction. Also, quote, urge him to atone for his significant, 
political errors by a great noble deed and to restore the synagogue as it was partly his responsibility that it was destroyed. What a powerful moral impression such an act would make on the whole world. And the city of Worms, even though it did not order the burning of the synagogue, it tolerated it and did not prevent it, as it would have been its historical and moral duty. Illert never replied to this letter. Carola Kaufmann-Levy in 1955 wrote to Illert, I do, I do not want to think that this holy place where a long chain of my ancestors searched for their God and found him should be degraded to a scene where more or less well-meaning people should form their opinion about the Jews who are foreign to them, about whom they will not be clearer than before, even after visiting such a memorial place. A synagogue should be only there where it serves its original purpose and where 10 Jews unite for prayer. There were much more letters and Illert never replied to them. Ernst Guggenheimer, who built synagogues in post Germany, vehemently argued against the reconstruction. He pointed out that Wiedergutmachung, making something good again, was definitely an, ambig an ambiguous motive. A letter from the city to the, to the Federal Office for Preservation of Heritage is, ex is exposing this motivation in 1958. The, resur the resurrection of the synagogue in Worms could be regarded as sufficient in the sense of restitution, which is the primary basis of the Worms reconstruction plan, the city of Worms in 1958. A footnote, in 1947, the huge standing remains of the Orthodox synagogue opposite were demolished with full consent of Illert, who stated in a letter to the French military government that this building bore no, or bore no architectural significance. Karl Heil, as social democratic director of the Worms Cultural Office, was opposing Illert's positions. Heil, in September 1949, wrote to federal president Theodor Heuss and suggested that the synagogue's reconstruction could be a strong gesture to the Jewish world, which was definitely not what Illert intended. Heuss then de developed a strong interest in the synagogue's reconstruction. From then on, correspondence between the federal state, monuments authorities, and the presidential office continued. And in 1952, Adenauer, the um, chancellor, raised the question of reconstruction and started to support the idea which I ten intensified after he was contacted by Isidor Kiefer. The legal situation with view to the Jewish objects was settled in 1956. And despite some ritual objects, the other items were all sent to Israel. From then on, official support for the reconstruction was possible. The Jewish community of Mainz acted more or less indifferent or opposite the reconstruction out of several reasons. Jews in Mainz, needed resources and a synagogue there. And the Federal Jewish Association of Rhineland Palatinate pointed out the need for a synagogue in Koblenz. A synagogue with no community seemed senseless to the survivors who struggled in the aftermath of the Holocaust while rebuilding lives and families and not the synagogues. After his retirement in 1958, Illard withdrew completely from the project. In 1959, when the foundation stone was celebrated, Rabbi Ernst Roth from Mainz underlined, the synagogue is built, but where are the people who once belonged to this synagogue? We see in the laying of the foundation stone also a foundation stone of a new era in which people will contemplate on the past, on the events, perhaps also on their own behavior in the last decades. This synagogue in its very existence and its, and its and in its very abandonment can serve as a warning. The city acted as the planning office and building contractor. The federal state and West Germany supported the reconstruction financially. The reconstruction cost no more than 500,000 Deutschmark and was carried out between 1957 and uh, 1961. Up to 1957, almost nothing had happened on the synagogue sites since the unauthorized reconstruction of the North Portal and the partly uncovering of the Mikve by Illert in 1947 and 1949. After some smaller excavations in 56 and 57, the
the debris removal began in 1957 with the aim of reusing as much of the original building material as possible. This was possible because the destruction in 1939 had buried original remains under debris. As a result, almost the entire outer wall was built with cast stone spolia, which therefore limited the addition of new material to a minimum. The reconstruction followed the plans and photos of the synagogue before 1938. All in inscription and stones saved from the rubble were integrated in the new building. It was built also on the foundation of the destroyed synagogue. The older parts with the, as I name, surviving stones are visibly distinguished from the new construction material. This is especially visible when looking at the Rashi throne and the yeshiva that shows the scars of the destruction. The biggest differences to the destroyed synagogue are the elimination of the organ gallery and the reduction of the actual prayer room to the former men's part. The initial step starting point was to create a Jewish memorial place, and it was decided much later to, to establish a functioning synagogue again. And this was the point when the Mainz community finally had to be involved in the project. Benches and the bima, et cetera, had to be integrated. The women's shul was rededicated and since then is used for gatherings and as a commemorative space for the victims of the Shoah and today also for exhibitions. On December 3, 1961, the new old synagogue was opened, its key handed over to the Mainz Jewish community. And in 1961, prominent visitors and guests were present, unlikely as in 1934. Police was assisting to secure the festivity distinct to their role in 1938. In 1966, the warm synagogue was inscribed as cultural heritage of Rhineland Palatinate. But it was up to the 1980s evident that it was, as Kaufmann had written, a kind of showplace. Definitions, narratives, and guided tours were initi initiated mainly by non Jews who did not question Illard's motives. That he and Kiefer were allies for the synagogue's reconstruction was a narrative of reconciliation, although it was only a small fraction of the real image. Worms was a symbolic Jewish topography. And Jewish visitors came with other perspective. They entered an empty synagogue where, as they often read, wrote in the, guest, in the guest book, only ghosts lived. The Worms, the Worms synagogue was a living Jewish heritage only when Jewish GIs held services or bar mitzvah was celebrated, or when Jewish groups visited and sang in the hall. After the 1990s, Jewish immigrants from the former Soviet Union arrived, settled in Worms, connected to the community in Mainz, and since then regular services are held in the synagogue as well as Purim parties and bar and bar mitzvahs or weddings. Now it is again a living space. This is something to question after willing or even genocidal destructions of heritage. How and why does politics deal with, those, with these post-traumatic spaces? The Worm Synagogue is still a post-traumatic space, although rebuilt 62 years ago. To reformulate Leo Beck, with this building, a covenant was again created between space and spirituality, past and present. Jewish spaces can reinvent themselves after times of pure violence. They can offer a space to evaluate a society's values and ideals and a place of honest encounter while serving Jews today again as their assembly room. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, moving contribution. Um, as we uh, discussed yesterday, you can rebuild, uh, you can bring back the building, you can rebuild uh, the stones, but you can never wipe away the trauma 
that will always be there. And yeah, and it's a, it's another heritage layer, of course, for these buildings. Um, are there any questions or? Yes, please come here. Oh. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I was uh, especially interesting for me was uh, this discrepancy which exists between, uh, about dealing with Jewish uh, past. That on one hand you have these buildings, and on the other hand, uh, it's, it's still open wound. And uh, you have mentioned uh, what is indicative for me is um, especially when uh, it concerns Jewish burials. You have mentioned that there was a cemetery. So what was the fate of, of these uh, um, tombs? Uh, historic. Yeah, it's it's the oldest still existing uh, cemetery in uh, north of the Alps, of the, uh, in situ. And uh, it was not destroyed uh, after 1933 or after 1938, um, because it was um, somehow like a, managed for further plans after the war, after the, the war should have been won by the Germans. And there are plans in the city archive that the whole cemetery should then be erased, deleted, and then rebuilt there some, some I don't know, barracks and a, a leader school, etc. But um, fortunately, the war was lost. <laughs> okay, um, are there other questions in the room? Yes, Thomas. Uh, the, the figure of Illard is so strange. I mean, was he a member of the, uh, not, uh, of the NSDAP? Uh, yeah. No, he was never a member of, of, the, of the Nazi party, but he took really advantage of, of everything. And uh, this, is, this is really interesting. It's a biography about him because his, his role is so, I mean... It's more than ambiguous. Crazy and atypical. And it's... Um, not yet. There are some starting points for bi biography, but he was um, somehow like an icon in, in the city of Worms. Uh, for for many reasons and from many perspectives, so um, I think it still lasts like fifteen years or something. If everyone who knew him personally is somehow like has passed away, I don't know. But it, it's worth writing this biography. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, more questions in the chat, maybe. No questions in the chat. Okay. Well, um, that concludes uh, this session. And while we have a break and we'll be back uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Um, so today I will be uh, presenting the reconstructing uh, the, the case study of, uh, of the, the St. Friday Church in Bucharest regarding uh, the, the reconstruction of religious buildings um, in the post-communist era. Um, so, during the dictatorship of Nicolae Ceausescu, hundreds of buildings were demolished to make way for the visions of the country's first architect. The engineer Eugenio Dacescu developed a unique system for moving large buildings that were uh, that was used to save uh, dozens of churches from demolition. He was called the engineer of heaven because he saved dozens of churches from demolition during the communist regime in Romania. And here on the slide, you can see him on the right hand side. Unfortunately, uh, the next case study. Uh, that I will present did not have the same fate. But first, I would like to show you some slides regarding the system that he developed and um, all of the churches that were moved during the, uh, the 80s uh, from the path of demolition. These are several churches and, and, and how oops, were they moved? 
and the whole system are underneath it. And he did not only move churches, but also entire blocks of flats. And he's very willing for that. This church, including the tower at the same time. And this is the church that we will be talking about. So on June the 19th, 1987, the Church of St. Friday, an iconic presence for believers, was demolished in Bucharest by the communist regime in Romania. Personally, the communist dictator Nicolae Ceausescu ordered the demolition of the church, disregarding its history and the opprobrium of the capital's population. The church was part of the group of 20 churches demolished during the communist regime. All these cult edifices were historical monuments founded between the 17th and the 19th centuries with great artistic value. The Church of St. Friday, the symbol of Bucharest, was one of the most beautiful churches in the capital. The history of the settlement stretches back to the 13th century. The Church of St. Friday was famous for the miracle working icon of St. Paraskeva, also called St. Friday. It comes from the Greek Paraskevi, which means Friday in Romania. The icon was painted, painted in Vienna in 1748 being later donated to the church by a rich family from Bucharest. A detailed description of the church's architecture can be found in the book called Proterieria, so, or the Deanery Third in Capital, edited by the Archdiocese of Bucharest. The church had large dimensions in plan, 30 by 15 meters, but of low height, it had a nave with circle circular side apses slightly flared. Two rows of pillars supported the vaults. Everything was under one roof, finished on the west facade with a pediment. The Tower of Almighty rises on the nave and the bell tower over the narthex. A small open porch with a pediment with an arch supported on sprouting columns precedes the entrance to the church, raised on a set of steps. The facades had a wide cornish uh, emphasized by a row of strongly raised denticles. The domes of the spires on an octagonal plan were covered with sheet metal wearing ornaments that gave it a special touch. So this is, um, these are some slides regarding the demolition of it. And this is the icon that I was talking about from Parasteva. And I wanted to show you um, here. Um, the orange dot is where it used to be. And the red dot is now the, its um, current location. So it was moved. 180 meters from its original location. Where am I supposed to? Okay. So the original location, how it was before, and now what is after? Still the original location. And on the right hand side, you can see that small monument with a cross that states that that is where it used to be. This is a picture for, from 2021-22 and how um, the state of it was, but um, fortunately it was cleaned. And this is its new location. This is um, 2000 uh, eight, I believe. Yeah, 2008. All right. <laughs> so um, regarding the altarpiece, it dated from 1839, and it was composed of a row of four registers with icons painted, painted on wood covered by silver brackets and surrounded by a rich relief, uh, relief uh, sculpture. 
The styles combined late neoclassicism with Baroque accents in the eclectic manner of the mid 19th century. The icon painting done in oil on wood panel technique falls into the Western realist, uh, realist style with Baroque influences. The panels of the icons are framed by gilded frames with, uh, richly carved with uh, organic floral elements or geometric elements. The place where the church is located was over time charged with a sacred history. In the 13th, 14th century, there was a holy place in the same place where the relics of two saints were brought by the ruler Mircha the Elder, 1368, 1408, the Saint Paraskeva and Saint Philoftea from the Patriarch of Ternovo from Bulgaria. Later, during the reign of ruler Matei Basarab, between 1632 and 1654, a new church was built in place of the old one. The church had a turbulent history, but every time the love of the faithful defended and revived it. In 1712, a fire partially destroyed the church, but it was rebuilt. In the 18th century, around the church, cells and buildings were built to shelter the poor and the sick. These buildings were later, later demolished in 1890s. In the earthquake of 1838, it suffered significant damage. In 1839, it was again rebuilt and enlarged to the shape it had until the demolition of nine, uh, that was in 1987. A new repair was made in 1887 when six columns were added to support the vaults. Next to the church, an infirmary and buildings for pilgrims were added in 1903. Later, in 1913, the turrets were modified and a portico was built at the entrance. The church was painted between 1980s, 1921, and carved wood carpentry were, uh, was added. Two major earthquakes, 1940s and 1977, affected the construction of the church. The church was consolidated again after the 1977 earthquake. In the years 1984-1986, important measures were taken to systemize the capital. Although it was initially decided to bypass the church or even relocate it, the dictator Ceausescu decided to demolish it precisely to suppress a holy place where the population found hope through prayers in those dark times. After the demolition of the church under the helpless eyes of the faithful, a carpet of tens of thousands of candles was placed over the ruins of the church. The security at that time did not have the courage to intervene to stop the demonstration of the population. Through a miracle, the parish priests saved the icons and holy objects which were taken to a monastery near Bucharest, namely in Chernika Monastery, and at a museum in Herosht Komen. After the anti-communist uh, anti revolution in 1989, Romania entered the path of European democracy. In March 2008, the love of the faithful won again and the church began to be rebuilt. So you would see the site over the years, 2008, 2011, and the church is already being built, rebuilt. These are some images from that time. This is from the interior. 2014, 2015. So you can see through comparison, the new church and the old one. And this is how it looks, its context in 2023. And these are some photographs from last week that I have taken. And you can see here that they're still working on it. So after more than 10 years, you see that um, it's a very slow process.
the walls are still not decorated, but you can already see the, um, the interior um, columns and the icons that were brought back. The floor decoration. And this um, is the restoration process for the items and um, the other objects uh, that were saved uh, from the church. Oh, sorry. Um, no, just a, a, a small um, last phrase. So after 10 years, in November 11th, 2018, the new uh, rebuilt church, identical to the demolished one, was consecrated and returned to the parishioners. All cult objects saved from the demolished church and kept in the other holy places were returned to the new church. So regarding Marcus question, why do we rebuild? Where do we rebuild? Does its um, original location matter? Um, these are still open questions. And um, as you already see, if, if the community wants to be rebuilt, then it will definitely happen as well as with the other study cases from uh, yesterday. So thank you for your attention. Yes. Okay. Why was this new location chosen? So, I mean, I, I could understand they couldn't build it where it used to be, yes. but how did they decide that this, this will, the new location will be the place where it will come? That I couldn't answer, but I can look into it exactly what, I mean, it, it was supposed to be close, at least uh, nearby the, its um, original, as you have seen now, it's just a small patch. And was it rebuilt in concrete? It seemed as a complete concrete uh, structure. Yeah. Any other questions? I hope we, we have overcome the technical problems, have we? So we will continue with um, Karl Magnus Melin, who is from the University of Gothenburg, but uh, apart from teaching, he's a carpenter and works with his hands and will be talking about uh, uh, full reconstruction of a wooden church. And so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and it's uh, really good to be here. And, uh, I don't see the presentation here. Thanks. Uh, I will talk about um, more of uh, reconstruction as a method of research. And um, today I also represent the Croft Laboratory. It's a natural center for heritage safeguarding crafts in Sweden. Uh, it's a part of the University of Gothenburg and it uh, works with practice-led craft research. 
to develop skills and knowledge to safeguard heritage buildings and sites for sustainable future. And uh, the Sora Roda Church was built originally about 1310. It was burnt down in an act of arson in 2001. And uh, the National General Heritage Board immediately decided it should be reconstructed to gain new knowledge about medieval uh, woodworking techniques. And as you can see on the map, uh, Sora Roda is a little village with almost uh, not so many houses. So it would be hard to motivate to reconstruct a church in this place only for the local society. So it was of uh, national importance. And this church was mainly known because of the uh, wall paintings from 1323. Um, by some unknown reason, there was a reconstruction built in Northern Finland. Um, and it, you can uh, argue if it's a reconstruction, it uh, is made of wood. Um, it has the same proportions, but it's totally out of context. And it built uh, without any understanding of the original design of techniques. And uh, this also leads me to think about the Venice Charter from 1965. Volvo Amazon from 1965. It was supposed to be one of the most safest car at the time to transport your kids. Uh, workplace safety and server Roda. And um, as with the uh, Volvo Amazon, it's not considered to be the safest car anymore. And I don't think the Venice Charter is the safest uh, charter either. <laughs> but uh, in Sera Roda, we took safety first. Oh, something happened there. Oh, didn't work. Anyway, um, we... Oh, there it happened. Uh, we took safety first and we had a lot of safety gear. Uh, we didn't transport any children in Volvo Amazon and we didn't use the Venice Charter. So what was the purpose with this reconstruction? It was to reconstruct lost craft knowledge to better understand, maintain and preserve our wooden heritage. Also to transfer of results to the public and the practitioners in heritage conservation. And it was uh, practice led craft research. The research uh, was coordinated by the Craft Laboratory, University of Gothenburg, and there was a transdisciplinary crew, but craft researchers as me, working as carpenters, led the research and uh, the hypothesis and uh, uh, made experiments. Um, uh, but we worked with a lot of different disciplines to get better understanding. Uh, in the beginning, you could say that if you simplify it, that we worked um, using modern craft tradition and norms, uh, natural sciences and so on, and had an out of context above perspective where we judged the medieval construction. Uh, but when in the end of the, the work, we had changed our perspective and rather tried to look from inside to use uh, medieval different perspectives, uh, perspectives of craft norms from the medieval times, from patrons, from forestry, the zeitgeist and so on. And this led to a lot of different results uh, compared when we judged it from above. Uh, we had some primary sources because the National Heritage Board said that when it should be reconstructed, it was one of the most documented churches in Sweden. Uh, it turned out that the uh, famous wall paintings was very well documented, but the structure not so much. Um, so we didn't make a copy of this construction, but we used uh, medieval um, uh, uh, illustrations and uh, writings as uh, this one. Does not geometry teach how to measure every dimension through which carpenters and stoneworkers work? Uh, this uh, quote is from Robert Kilwarby, 
and Archbishop of Canterbury about 1250. So we didn't use the meter system, we used uh, geometry instead. And uh, it took a lot of time to analyze and deconstruct uh, the geometry of the church. But when we then made a full scale um, uh, on the ground, it took 15 minutes when we have solved the, the way to do it. Um, and um, craft research, uh, it's, uh, we are professional carpenters trained in um, academic as well. And we have made experiments uh, based on several historic sources. Here is an experiment where we attempt to clean 13 meter long uh, rafters. Uh, we had one shot to do this um, and it hadn't been done for maybe 700 years, but um, we were brave, so we tried. And um, anyhow, um, um, this is not from the Savaroda reconstruction, it's a, a sister project. So we have collaborated with many different projects to get as much synergy effects as possible. And uh, in the Savaroda project, we, we didn't take any shortcuts. We, we felled the trees in the forest uh, to get the same uh, um, experience as in the medieval times to learn from the past. Uh, and 13 meter long is like spaghetti. Um, and we also learned how you can move this big pine wood forest uh, from the forest. You don't need a horse, you don't need an oxen. It's just to carry it out. And 13 meters is quite long as you can see. It never ends. Uh, so we also have made a lot of videos uh, just to share this knowledge. So this and many other films can be seen on uh, uh, the Craft Laboratory's YouTube side. And uh, uh, the, it also was uh, many other churches or buildings from the time that we used as references because uh, we had not a single photograph uh, from the attic of the burned down church. So in another sister project, we restored a tight barn from 1294 and we could use this knowledge to reconstruct uh, uh, the gable. But uh, we worked in different realities. Uh, empirical 13th or 14th century techniques versus modern regulations. Uh, we waited a very long time, several years, before we dared to contact an engineer because we were really afraid he would say, like, the hummingbird can't fly because uh, it has too small wings. So um, we handpicked an engineer that has been working for 30 years with medieval constructions. and. I really prepared a lot to tell him uh, that we didn't want to make it stronger or different because then it wouldn't be an experiment. Uh, so we were very well prepared when he arrived and when he had made his calculation, he said, it works. Uh, so we had been uh, scared unnecessary. Uh, but by doing everything by hand, we have learned so much that we now much better can see on the original constructions, what they represent and how they are done. And uh, we also have synergy effects with other projects uh, in the craft laboratory. Uh, shingle roofing is a big uh, uh, thing in Sweden on churches and um, it's very costly. And uh, until recently, a lot of uh, the wood has been uh, imported from Russia. Uh, strange for a uh, country like Sweden with a lot of pine, but we don't have these really, really old pines. So now we are working to look at um, other traditional um, uh, wood species we can use as uh, aspen and um, oak. Oak has been very much used before, but um, uh, 
the latest years it has not been used so much so we work uh, together with several different uh, projects to learn more so some uh, results of the craft scientific reconstruction so far uh, we have worked a lot with transfer of knowledge uh, we have made a lot of international and um, national papers uh, there are lots of videos on the craft laboratories youtube channel uh, there's a portal called the Sarroda portal with augmented reality models and um, some um, reports and so on uh, about uh, the reconstruction work and we have been mentoring students um, on the small picture there you can see um, amanda she started as an uh, apprentice uh, with us uh, and she we mentored her to re do the reconstruction of the doors and uh, now she is a professional um, carpenter and having own students uh, and um, we have made a booklet uh, uh, today it's only existing in swedish but we plan to translate it to english as well and it's uh, available uh, also uh, as a pdf and uh, here's uh, um, from the portal there there is uh, 3d models um, didn't work but uh, anyway on these 3d models you can uh, take away the roof and uh, so on and we had a lot of synergies with uh, several diocese projects uh, some are ongoing and some have stopped i was a project leader for the Carpentry art in the diocese of Lund. Almost uh, ten years we worked with the general aims to preserve by enlightenment what is known can be valued and what is valued can be saved. And this was really important. Uh, all these uh, diocese project probably wouldn't have started uh, if it wasn't for the revelation that the most known church in Sweden we knew very little about. So um, now we know a lot more. And uh, another sister project is, um, I told a little bit, is the Tithe Barn in uh, Ingatorp. Um, this couldn't have been restored in the way it was without Söderåda. And we got um, the Europa Nostra award for this. I was really, it was really strange uh, when Europa Nostra contacted us because it was not like Versailles or something. It was a really, really small type barn in uh, Sweden. But uh, anyway, it was really nice. And uh, we are continuing where even if the reconstruction of the structure uh, is finished, we have an upcoming idea to also do a craft scientific uh, reconstruction project concerning 14th century painting techniques in Europe on wood. Uh, the original um, paintings from 1323 uh, had strong connections to um, book illustrations uh, in France. So we think it's really important to make this as, as a European project. But uh, we will have a st first seminar to start to get funding for this. Uh, so as a conclusion or whatever, um, the Södra Röda mo model of reconstruction. Research through reconstruction, results used to preserve use and maintain our heritage in wood. And the method is to reconstruct craft and craft norms through transdisciplinary in-depth analysis of primary sources. And very important to collaborate with other projects and experts to gain as much synergies as possible. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. I was wondering um, about uh, the wood when you uh, produce the spaghetti. It was a fresh wood. Right? Absolutely. And when we were building, uh, the wood shrinks with time. Yeah. So have you used any technology to, to prevent this wood from shrinking? Uh, 
we, we let it dry uh, for a little while, maybe one or two months, it differed a bit, because uh, there are many different traditions, uh, both from medieval times and current times. In England, it's still very used to building green oak, uh, but in modern uh, carpentry in Sweden, it's usually dry wood. So, so we tried it a lot and uh, there, we have found some old receipt how you can uh, make it less shrinkable that we will test uh, in the future. Uh, it's wonderful. I mean, it's, uh, and uh, what what you also stress that it's learning by doing. So how much information we can actually get out of making this reconstruction the way we think they did it in the Middle Ages and learning uh, from from the building itself or well the parish building, but also from still extinct extinct uh, buildings uh, around. But who's paying for it? So how is it fine? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, the National Heritage Board uh, gave a lot of money and the region as well. But uh, if you ask me how much did it cost, it's really hard to say because we collaborated so very much with different projects to get a lot further. If we only used the money from the National Heritage Board and the region and not the diocese projects, not uh, the students we involved and and so on, then we wouldn't have come half the way. So this uh, way of working together uh, with lots of uh, people and experts was essential for the result. I, I, I can only add that uh, we have been following and really admiring the work we've done in sort of other and, and the adjacent project also. And because it's so well public and publicized also, so you can without going there, which would be of course best <laughs> to hear learn, it is possible to, to follow what, what you're doing and, and see the results. So thank you. Thank you. Um, how long? Uh, the church burned down in 2001. And first there was like um, investigations of archives and so on, but the prax the reconstruction uh, started in 2007 and the funding wasn't clear from the beginning. We got like money for one or two years at a time and uh, it was supposed to be finished in, I think, 2012 was the first date. And I'm really, really happy that we didn't get a lot of money at uh, the beginning because then we wouldn't also have gotten half the way that we did. So time was uh, a wonderful. Uh, colleague to work with. And we will come to our final paper this uh, in this uh, conference, Jack Mullen, uh, who's online. Now, anyway, he's uh, in, in in charge and really enthusiastic about uh, uh, the knee and uh, uh, and Notre Dame, and we will hear about the reconstruction uh, as soon as we can actually hear him. Okay, hello. We can see you now. <laughs> Bonjour tous. Et merci de, de m'accueillir pour vous parler de la reconstruction du, du clocher nord de la cathédrale Saint-Denis. Excusez-moi tout d'abord de maîtriser trop mal l'allemand et l'anglais pour m'exprimer décemment en public avec ces, ces langues. Cette présentation sera donc faite en français, mais je parlerai lentement et j'ai multiplié les images pour que chacun puisse suivre mon propos. Au demeurant, le chantier de Saint-Denis sera ouvert au public dès l'année prochaine, durant cinq ou six ans, et vous y serez les bienvenus pour découvrir en vrai les images que vous verrez aujourd'hui. 
Alors, vous le savez, euh, les cathédrales peuvent être victimes de, de leur âge, de leur fragilité ou de drames comme les guerres ou les incendies. Pour répondre à ces traumatismes, parfois très durs, les services patrimoniaux européens ont su apporter depuis longtemps euh, des solutions nuancées, mais toutes convergentes. Lorsqu'un fidèle ou un visiteur pénètre aujourd'hui dans les cathédrales de Cologne, de Vienne ou de Nevers, leur état presque ruiné de 1945 n'apparaît plus guère, et c'est tant mieux. Les monuments peuvent toutefois être victimes d'une autre forme de détérioration, plus lente et plus insidieuse, l'indifférence. Elle se traduit par une dégradation plus durable et pire encore que celle d'un incendie, car elle ne produit pas le sursaut qui aide souvent à dépasser une destruction violente. Aussi célèbre qu'elle puisse apparaître, surtout à l'étranger, la cathédrale de Saint-Denis est un bon exemple de ce processus d'oubli collectif. Fondée au VIIe siècle, à quelques kilomètres au nord de Paris, l'abbaye de Saint-Denis devint rapidement la première abbaye de France. Next. Merci. Plusieurs rois mérovingiens y furent enterrés, suivis par les parents et une partie de la descendance de Charlemagne, puis par pratiquement tous les rois médiévaux et modernes, les rois de France, bien sûr. Surtout, l'abbaye participa directement à la structuration du pouvoir royal. Le roi Louis VI y fut élevé, les abbés Suger et Mathieu de Vendôme devinrent régents de France et les moines de la communauté fournirent nombre de chanceliers, de trésoriers et d'historiographes royaux. La reine Marie de Médicis y fut même couronnée. À ce rôle historique répondit presque à chaque siècle une architecture exceptionnelle. Next. Après les églises de l'Antiquité tardive et carolingienne, dont il ne reste que des vestiges, c'est à Saint-Denis que l'abbé Sujet développa les premières formes de l'architecture gothique, avec la reconstruction du massif occidental à gauche et du chevet à droite entre 1130 et 1144. Next. Un siècle plus tard, c'est à Saint-Denis que l'architecture gothique rayonnante atteignit son point culminant, lorsque la partie centrale de l'abbatiale fut reconstruite. Et les façades de son transept servirent de modèle à celles de Notre-Dame de Paris et de bien d'autres monuments d'Europe. Next. C'est encore dans l'Église que les plus beaux tombeaux français de la Renaissance furent élevés et la réfection des bâtiments abbatiaux au XVIIIe siècle fut digne du Louvre ou de Versailles. Next. Plus récemment, l'abbatiale fut le chantier où l'architecte François Debray développa les premières techniques françaises de restauration patrimoniale à partir de 1813. Puis Eugène Viollet-le-Duc à droite rétablit le cimetière royal en 1860 afin d'accompagner le nouveau chœur et le caveau qu'il construisait pour Napoléon III. En conséquence d'une telle présence historique, au cours de laquelle l'abbatiale reçut le titre de basilique, et, de, et en fait elle devint, au cours de tous ces siècles, le point culminant de la cité. Next. Mais l'instauration de la Troisième République se traduisit euh, par une réaction inverse, et d'autant plus forte que la ville de Saint-Denis devint au même moment le principal centre industriel de la région parisienne. Après avoir été la ville des rois morts, elle devint celle d'un peuple vivant, turbulent, dont le pouvoir républicain successeur de la commune de Paris se méfiait. Cette distance prit de multiples formes. D'abord, la basilique fut gommée de l'espace urbain. Next 
Autre... Merci. Alors que sa silhouette hérissée de tours, vous le voyez à gauche, avait dominé pendant des siècles le paysage du nord de Paris, la flèche de la croisée, les toitures des tours du transept, des quatre tours du transept, puis la tour nord de la façade avec sa grande flèche de pierre, furent peu à peu supprimées. L'église verticale devint une église horizontale, comme vous le voyez sur la photo de droite, comme pour se fondre dans la neutralité de la banlieue et ne pas concurrencer le rayonnement des monuments parisiens. La distance fut également intellectuelle. Durant tout le XXe siècle, aucun historien de l'art français ne s'intéressa réellement à Saint-Denis. Les travaux les plus significatifs dont le monument bénéficia furent ceux d'Erwin Panofsky, Summer McCrosby, Robert Branner et Caroline Bruselius, tous américains. Next. L'un des moines de l'abbaye, Don Doublet, qui rédigea la première monographie historique de son établissement en 1625, a été réédité en 2009 par Kessinger Rare Reprints, à droite, installé dans le Montana, aux États-Unis, et reste introuvable à Paris. L'Église disparut ainsi de la recherche scientifique française. Et aujourd'hui encore, ses meilleurs connaisseurs sont deux Suisses et ses tombeaux royaux restent à étudier. L'Église n'étant plus ni valorisée ni publiée, elle s'enfonça dans l'oubli. Next. En 2010, ces portails occidentaux restaient noirs de pollution, vous le voyez à gauche, et sa rose sud était étayée depuis plusieurs années. Next. Les vitraux anciens du déambulatoire avaient été déposés et remplacés depuis longtemps par des décolcomanies en plastique, qui étaient à leur tour ruinés, et le cœur de l'église conservait un aménagement provisoire hérité de Vatican II. Next. Enfin, le, le chevet transformé en musée n'accueillait que 130 000 visiteurs par an, soit un centième de la fréquentation de Notre-Dame de Paris avant l'incendie. Ce qui n'avait rien d'étonnant puisque le monument ne bénéficie d'aucun espace d'interprétation et n'est plus chauffé depuis les années 1950. En un siècle et en un mot, la basilique de Saint-Denis était devenue une des cathédrales les plus négligées d'Europe. Dans cette déshérence, la situation administrative du monument n'arrangeait pas les choses. Depuis le concordat de 1805, l'Église est propriété de l'État et le clergé en est affectataire, c'est-à-dire l'équivalent d'un locataire à titre gratuit. L'État est donc responsable de la conservation de l'édifice et en a confié la gestion à la conservation régionale des monuments historiques d'Île-de-France. Mais l'accueil des visiteurs est délégué à un autre organisme de l'État, le Centre des monuments nationaux. Deux organismes qui n'ont pas toujours les mêmes objectifs. Du côté du clergé, la basilique est devenue cathédrale en 1968, après la création de l'évêché de Saint-Denis. L'évêque décide donc les aménagements qu'il concerne, mais l'entretien de l'Église dépend de la paroisse, qui le, qui le laisse à quelques bonnes volontés peu présentes. Enfin, et comme depuis des siècles, la ville se sent concernée par la basilique, qu'elle considère comme son monument phare. Next. Elle a implanté une station de métro à proximité euh, du, de, de l'église, a rendu le parvis piétonnier, elle organise chaque année un festival de musique très fréquenté et met à la disposition de l'État ses équipes archéologiques. Mais elle n'a aucune compétence officielle sur le monument. Parmi ces différents intervenants, chacun a a toujours été de bonne volonté, mais en 2010, force était de constater qu'il consacrait plus d'énergie à se critiquer qu'à agir. Selon un processus anthropique, anthropique courant, la, la situation se traduisait par une fréquentation publique et des crédits de travaux chaque année plus réduits. Pour tenter de sortir de cet enlisement, aussi bien patrimonial, 
intellectuel que financier, un architecte a peu de moyens. Mais s'il connaît les monuments, le monument qui lui est confié, il peut trouver des leviers. En 1846 et 1847, le démontage de la flèche et du clocher nord de l'église devait précéder leur remontage. Mais le régime qui avait commandé les travaux tomba l'année suivante et le chantier fut interrompu. Next. Peu après, l'architecte du monument, Eugène Viollet-le-Duc, privilégia une reconstruction complète et à neuf du massif occidental plutôt que sa restauration. Les aléas politiques aidant, ni son projet grandiose, ni le remontage du clocher nord de la basilique n'eurent finalement de suite. Et depuis le milieu du XIXe siècle, la ville de Saint-Denis considère la disparition de sa flèche comme une amputation. Tous les monuments détruits ne font pas l'objet d'un tel regret collectif. Mais les cartes postales éditées depuis le XIXe siècle par la ville illustrent bien ce sentiment. Next avec des véhicules et des personnages qui changent selon les générations, elle montre systématiquement la façade amoindrie juxtaposée à une vue de l'ancienne façade complète avec ses deux tours. En écho à cette vox populi, les municipalités de Saint-Denis réclamèrent régulièrement à l'État la reconstruction de la flèche détruite. Un projet fut même approuvé en 1992 et seul le manque de moyens de la ville, alors mobilisé par une importante restructuration urbaine, empêcha sa mise en œuvre. Depuis plus de 20 ans, au regret de la flèche s'ajoutait donc le regret d'une occasion de reconstruction manquée. Et lorsque j'ai été chargé de la cathédrale de Saint-Denis par le ministère de la Culture, je savais que la municipalité était prête à entendre un nouveau discours. La restauration de la façade occidentale, dont vous avez vu la photo lorsque je montrais le parvis, m'en a donné l'opportunité. Depuis Viollet-le-Duc, la façade rétablie par Debré était considérée comme fautive et les interventions qui étaient menées sur elle tendaient à faire disparaître ses apports. Next vous le voyez sur ces deux clichés, où toutes les sculptures étaient petit à petit remplacées par des parements droits. En enlevant les ornements et décors que Debré avait rapportés sur la façade, chacun pensait revenir au monument médiéval. Mais cette idée était un leurre, car les travaux, au mieux, auraient retrouvé la façade appauvrie par les ravalements commandés en 1770 par les moines de l'abbaye, puis euh, par les destructions opérées en 1793 par quelques révolutionnaires avinés. Ces, ces enlèvements du décor de Debré négligeaient également l'importance de son œuvre dans l'histoire de la basilique, alors qu'elle avait fait l'objet, en son temps, d'une attention exceptionnelle et qu'elle avait véritablement fondé en France l'art de la restauration. À l'opposé de la démarche suivie depuis plus d'un siècle, j'ai donc proposé de restaurer la façade dans l'état que Debré lui avait donné, en rétablissant, si nécessaire, ses décors disparus. Next. Vous en voyez là un élément du projet qui fut approuvé euh, par, après avis favorable de la Commission nationale non des monuments historiques, et le chantier correspondant dura de 2012 à 2015. Comme les travaux de la façade se déroulaient devant les fenêtres de la mairie, ils remirent évidemment en mémoire le vieux rêve municipal de reconstruction de la flèche. Grâce à la documentation dont je disposais, je savais cette reconstruction possible. Et lorsque j'allais voir le maire, il me donna son accord. Il fallait toutefois trouver un financement sans solliciter l'État qui devait se consacrer prioritairement à la restauration de la basilique. Il fallait surtout obtenir de nouveau son autorisation. Je me chargeais du premier volet en proposant un chantier financé par ses visites, 
comme celui du château de Guédelon que j'avais lancé avec succès en 1997 ou comme celui de la Sagrada Familia à Barcelone. Implanté dans l'agglomération parisienne et sur un monument exceptionnel, je savais qu'un tel chantier était capable de recevoir plusieurs centaines de milliers de visiteurs par an. Sur 20 ou 30 ans, ce qui correspondait au temps de construction d'un grand clocher médiéval, il pouvait à lui seul assurer la reconstruction de la flèche et démultiplier la fréquentation de l'édifice. Pour l'autorisation de travaux, fort improbable, à obtenir à un moment où sévissait un véritable minimalisme comportemental dans la prise en charge des monuments historiques français. Le maire s'en chargea. Après deux refus successifs des plus hautes instances administratives, il porta la question devant le président de la République, François Hollande. En effet, le projet représentait pour les élus locaux l'opportunité de transformer l'image de la ville, l'image d'une ville trop souvent réduite à quelques drames sociaux. Pour les responsables municipaux, le chantier était une occasion de fierté retrouvée pour une population victime d'ostracisme. Pour moi, elle était l'occasion de faire basculer l'indifférence dans laquelle la basilique était tombée. Le président de la République soutint le projet. En dépit de quelques combats d'arrière-garde, il fut mis au point, puis approuvé par le ministère de la Culture en janvier 2022. Le temps manque ici pour parler du projet à proprement parler, dans tous ses détails et avec l'ensemble des arguments archéologiques, documentaires et techniques qui conduisirent à cette autorisation. Ces points pourraient à eux seuls faire l'objet d'une autre conférence. Il est plus important de voir comment une idée a priori interdite a pu, comme je le souhaitais, renouveler les comportements sur la basilique. Et quand je dis « interdit », je pèse mes mots. N'oublions pas que, encore récemment, un porte-parole éminent du service des monuments historiques présentait le projet de reconstruction de la flèche comme « impensable ». Tout d'abord, et pour affirmer clairement son soutien, François Hollande se rendit à Saint-Denis pour les Journées du patrimoine de 2015. Next. C'était la première fois qu'un président de la République visitait officiellement le monument. La presse suivit et le projet de reconstruction de la flèche fit l'objet de nombreux articles. Le public en boîte à le pas et les week-ends, après une émission télévisuelle consacrée à la reconstruction de la flèche, ce sont plusieurs dizaines de milliers de visiteurs qui découvrirent le monument. La polémique, lancée parallèlement par quelques historiens de l'art peu scrupuleux, ne fit que renforcer l'enthousiasme. Les inexactitudes avancées réduisirent les critiques à quelques arguments d'opportunité et firent valoir que, pour quelques pseudo-spécialistes qui trouvaient l'occasion d'exister grâce à un mauvais combat, les principaux historiens et historiens de l'art français soutenaient le projet. Après un siècle de négligence, la cathédrale de Saint-Denis revenait donc peu à peu sur le devant de la scène publique et la visite récente du roi d'Angleterre jeudi dernier n'a fait que le confirmer. Le financement de la flèche évolua dans le même sens et, à la demande des élus, le projet s'organisa désormais sur un délai plus court et avec le financement de la région et des départements périphériques de Paris, qui avaient compris qu'il ne s'agissait pas seulement d'un projet de monument, mais d'un projet de développement territorial. La cathédrale retrouva dans le même temps une actualité scientifique. En 2020, grâce aux recherches et relevés effectués pour l'étude de la flèche, j'ai pu publier dans le bulletin monumental un article réactualisant notamment l'œuvre de sujet et les travaux effectués par Debray au début du XIXe siècle. Next. Un autre article révéla le rôle contestable joué par Viollet-le-Duc dans la démolition du clocher. Le nettoyage des portails occidentaux contribua également à une analyse nouvelle de ces sculptures que proposèrent Damien Bernet et Philippe Plagneux. Une grande exposition suivie au musée de Cluny à Paris. Puis les fouilles effectuées pour la consolidation du massif occidental, préalablement aux travaux de reconstruction du clocher, 
apportèrent d'autres informations sur la construction du massif occidental et la sculpture parisienne antérieure aux travaux de sujet. Enfin, les redécouvertes effectuées parallèlement sur les vitraux de la cathédrale, ainsi que sur son architecture et sur ses parements peints, remirent l'ancienne abbatiale de Saint-Denis dans l'actualité de la recherche française en histoire de l'art. En conséquence de ces changements, les travaux de restauration de la cathédrale reprirent. Tout d'abord, l'évêché profita du regain d'intérêt apporté au monument pour réaménager le cœur. Next. Grâce à un travail partagé avec la conservation régionale des monuments historiques, un nouvel emmarchement put être établi en réutilisant des dalles de pierre et des grilles qui avaient été déposées il y a plus de 50 ans et qui provenaient de l'ancien cœur de Viollet-le-Duc. De son côté, l'évêché commanda le nouvel hôtel et l'embon correspondant au sculpteur Vladimir Zbinovski. L'hôtel, percé d'une croix et couvert d'une dalle de verre, établit ainsi un lien, vous le voyez à gauche, entre le nouveau cœur liturgique et le cimetière antique dont la cathédrale était issue. Next. Parallèlement, la crypte fut réaménagée en y replaçant les sarcophages que les fouilles des années 1960 en avaient enlevés. Et vous voyez la croix de l'autel qui est projetée au centre des sarcophages depuis, euh, depuis le cœur haut de l'église. Peu après, la ministre de la Culture vint à Saint-Denis pour parler du projet Flèche. Elle découvrit la rose du bras sud du transept étayée depuis 15 ans. Next. Elle débloqua donc les crédits nécessaires à sa restauration. Le chantier se déroula de 2019 à 2020 et fut l'occasion de rétablir les badigeons intérieurs légèrement colorés qui avaient été grattés comme partout dans l'église jusqu'à récemment. Ce badigeon, refait à partir des vestiges qui subsistent derrière l'orgue, a permis de retrouver une lecture des lignes architecturales de la cathédrale qui disparaissait jusqu'alors sous ses joints encrassés. Next. De même, une donation faite à l'État pour accompagner la reconstruction de la flèche a été consacrée à la restauration du déambulatoire. Vous en voyez les premiers pas à droite. L'étude menée dans cet objectif a été l'occasion de redécouvrir de nombreux panneaux de vitraux authentiques et de rétablir deux verrières selon leur composition du XIIe siècle. Next. Les observations faites à l'occasion de ce travail ont conduit à une véritable relecture de la vitrerie établie par sujet. Vous en voyez à droite le dessin que nous avons fait au bureau à partir de quelques médaillons anciens conservés, en complément bien évidemment d'une relecture de l'architecture profondément euh, renouvelée euh, du déambulatoire. Au-delà de ces études et de ces premiers chantiers qui s'achèvent actuellement, les services de l'État viennent de demander à mon successeur, Christophe Bottineau, un schéma directeur pour une restauration raisonnée de la basilique et pour l'aménagement d'un accueil des visiteurs digne de ce nom. Next. Ces programmes mettront de nombreuses années à se réaliser, mais grâce à un projet de flèche voulu non pas comme un simple objectif architectural, mais comme un moyen de redonner vie à un monument, la cathédrale de Saint-Denis sort enfin de l'indifférence dans laquelle elle était tombée. Un projet peut donc être conçu comme une dynamique, et cette dynamique s'avère d'autant plus efficace que le projet a pu tout d'abord choquer. Rudy Ricciotti a donné comme titre à l'un de ses livres « L'architecture est un sport de combat ». À sa manière, la restauration du patrimoine l'est peut-être aussi. Alors, selon le temps dont je dispose encore, je vous proposerai quelques images rapides du déroulement euh, actuel du projet. Next. Les fouilles archéologiques euh, à l'aplomb du clocher ont commencé l'année dernière. Euh, non, non. Ne, voilà, merci. Les, euh, vous les voyez à droite, ces fouilles ont commencé euh, l'année dernière et euh, sont maintenant achevées. On est en train de rédiger les rapports euh, correspondants. La consolidation du massif occidental est en cours, vous en voyez quelques-uns des premiers travaux à gauche, et doit s'achever au printemps prochain. Les travaux consistent à élargir les fondations 
pour rétablir un appui équilibré du massif occidental en dépit de l'assèchement moderne du sous-sol et de consolider les maçonneries hautes qui ont été désorganisées euh, par les intempéries depuis neuf siècles euh, au moyen d'injections de chaux et de quelques tyrans. Next. Parallèlement, euh, les plans détaillés de la tour et du clocher ont été mis au point par le bureau en respectant scrupuleusement les dispositions données par les plans d'appareils fournis par le 19e siècle. Nous avons du 19e siècle plus de 40 planches d'attachement avec plusieurs dizaines de dessins chacune qui nous précisent les dimensions, les profils de chaque pierre. Et euh, entre les pierres anciennes conservées depuis le 19e siècle et celles qui ont été encore retrouvées par les fouilles, nous avons plus de 300 pierres provenant de la flèche qui nous offrent autant de témoignages des matériaux d'origine, des modes de taille d'origine, des outils utilisés au 12e et jusqu'au 19e siècle pour travailler sur la flèche, euh, on, et surtout ces, euh, ces pierres retrouvées, qui sont toutes numérotées, nous ont permis d'avoir confirmation de la validité des documents du 19e siècle. Vous savez à quel point une information en valide une autre dans cette espèce d'enquête que représente euh, la, la restitution euh, d'un ouvrage disparu, et on a là une somme de documents concordants absolument sans équivalent, c'est une formule peut-être rapide mais vraie. Nous avons sur le clocher de Saint-Denis disparu plus de documents que nous, avons, que nous en avons sur la plupart des clochers de la même époque qui subsistent encore en France. Next. La... Parallèlement, la... les plans détaillés de la tour ont été mis au point en respectant scrupuleusement leur disposition du XIXe siècle, et l'ensemble euh, est synthétisé par une numérisation de chaque pierre permettant la traçabilité euh, depuis son extraction en carrière jusqu'à sa pose. Vous avez là quelques-uns des premiers éléments de la modélisation du clocher qui est faite à partir de chacune des pierres et en regard à droite, les dessins d'appareils de chacune de ces pierres euh, qui seront fournis aux entreprises. Next. À partir de ces dessins, nous avons nous-mêmes, et on n'a pas confié ce travail à l'entreprise qui sera chargée des travaux, nous avons nous-mêmes défini ce que devaient être les blocs capables, c'est-à-dire les blocs extraits de carrière, au sein duquel chacun des, chacune des pierres de la flèche et du clocher euh, devront être refaites. Vous voyez la définition sur un claveau et sur un fragment de la flèche à gauche de ces blocs capables. Et à droite, nous avons euh, euh, accompagné chacune des faces des pierres de trois types de euh, modalités de traitement, les, la queue des pierres, les parties en contact avec les, le moellonnage, avec le blocage, sont toutes, seront toutes laissées brutes de carrière, c'est la figuration bleue que vous voyez à droite, ce sont des pierres lorsqu'on les a retrouvées qui n'ont jamais été travaillées et qu'il n'y a aucune raison aujourd'hui de travailler aujourd'hui. Les euh, parements jaunes, du moins les faces jaunes, sont des faces qui sont travaillées simplement en taille d'approche, à l'outil grossier relativement approximatif, qui donne une irrégularité à la surface et aux joints propres aux, aux pierres médiévales. Enfin, ne sont parmentés à l'outil fin euh, que les parements vus, que vous voyez en rose sur ces deux pierres. Donc chacune des pierres est assortie du mode de taille correspondant. Next. Et vous voyez par exemple sur une de ces pierres qui a été récupérée de la voûte effondrée de Notre-Dame de Paris lors du dernier incendie, euh, cette pierre du XIIIe siècle, de la première moitié du XIIIe siècle, vous voyez très bien l'arrière de ce claveau euh, qui a euh, ses parties brutes de carrière, euh, là où il y a marqué 5 en bas de la photo, vous voyez très bien euh, les, euh, les joints latéraux, les faces latérales travaillées à l'outil à bretelé de manière assez grossière. Et enfin, seul le parement vu était travaillé avec euh, un layage extrêmement fin qui lui donne bien évidemment un aspect, trois aspects très différents. Next. Alors, l'objectif de ce chantier euh, est pour moi de retrouver bien évidemment les dispositions anciennes de la flèche, 
euh, les dispositions pour cela de chacune de ces pierres, mais surtout la méthode de travail qui avait permis de les obtenir. Euh, nous, je crois que l'on ne peut pas restaurer un bâtiment si on essaye de reproduire son aspect. Pour obtenir correctement son aspect, on doit, euh, quelle que soit la précision des dessins dont on dispose, on doit reproduire la méthode de travail qui a permis d'obtenir cet aspect. Et je crois que c'est déterminant pour les dispositions euh, et l'authenticité finale de l'ouvrage. Euh, donc derrière la reconstruction de la flèche de Saint-Denis, c'est en réalité euh, la redécouverte des pratiques anciennes de taille qui m'intéresse de telle sorte que le chantier devienne un vrai chantier de formation de tailleurs de pierre spécialisé dans la restauration patrimoniale. Vous savez que la France a la chance de conserver beaucoup d'entreprises dites traditionnelles, mais que la plupart de ces savoir-faire traditionnels, ben d'une part, ont été, euh, ils ont tous été réinventés au 19e et au 20e siècle, parce qu'il n'existe aucune pratique médiévale qui est parvenue jusqu'à nous, la, et que cette reproduction des euh, méthodes anciennes est à revalider en permanence si on ne veut pas qu'elle soit perturbée. Il y a énormément de techniques modernes qui sont venues accompagner la restauration euh, du patrimoine et bien évidemment la taille de pierre. Il ne viendrait à l'idée aujourd'hui de personne de se passer de l'utilité d'une grue ou d'un camion euh, ou d'un échafaudage sécurisé. Euh, en revanche, euh, ce travail de mécanisation euh, est parfois venu se substituer au geste euh, authentique. Or, c'est ce geste qui donne la forme la, euh, la qualité et toute la valeur d'un ouvrage refait. Donc, il faut euh, totalement s'ouvrir aux mécanisations qui apportent une plus-value à l'ouvrage, mais se méfier constamment des euh, technicités trop modernes qui parviennent à scier des pierres, à avoir des layages mécaniques et finalement un aspect de l'ouvrage restauré totalement étranger à celui d'origine. C'est un des défauts de, des entreprises de restauration d'avoir parfois beaucoup trop euh, mécanisé et beaucoup trop caricaturé les travaux anciens. Donc, le chantier de Saint-Denis sera pendant plusieurs années une école de formation des tailleurs de pierre pour qu'ils apprennent à retrouver, grâce à la mécanisation et grâce à tous les moyens contemporains, le geste médiéval. Vous avez ici euh, les premières expériences que nous avons faites il y a depuis 1997 euh, à Guédelon, en Bourgogne, et euh, ce chantier expérimental a été une véritable redécouverte des techniques anciennes de construction en maçonnerie, en charpente, en couverture, en technique, en, en, en taille de pierre, en, en, en décor peint, euh, en, en métallerie, en, en, en ferronnerie. Euh, on a pu redécouvrir, grâce à Guédelon, une véritable écologie de ce qu'était un chantier médiéval, et sans paraphraser euh, les équipes médiévales, euh, ce n'est pas notre objectif à Saint-Denis, c'est euh, parvenir à connaître, à retrouver et à réinterpréter de bonne manière euh, ces techniques euh, que le chantier de la basilique devra servir. Je vous remercie de votre attention, j'espère avoir été euh, dans les temps qui m'étaient impartis, et si vous avez des questions, j'y répondrai avec plaisir. Euh, je vous remercie pour cette présentation très intéressante. Uh, uh, alors, zijn er vragen? Are there questions? No? Um, Are there questions in the chat? Yes, I would like to. Hello. Yes. Bonjour. Uh, je vais poser ma question en français et je vais traduire. Je suis interpellée, Monsieur Moulin. Déjà, félicitations pour ce sport de combat, comme vous le dites. Euh, vous avez parlé du minimalisme institutionnel de prise en charge du patrimoine culturel français. Je pense que c'est un leitmotiv à taille européenne. Est-ce que vous pouvez euh, nous dire ce que vous avez observé depuis toutes ces décennies, décennies par rapport à, à, 
il y a des changements. Est-ce que les institutions répondent bien mieux ce jour-ci Comme d'habitude, il y a un processus d'enquistement des idées. À un moment au XIXe siècle, parfois même avant, selon les pays, parfois après, des services patrimoniaux ont été créés pour répondre à une volonté publique d'intervenir sur le patrimoine, de conserver ce patrimoine, de le réutiliser et de le remettre en valeur. Puis, avec le temps, ces services finissent par décliner une logique de fonctionnement qui leur est propre, au point parfois d'oublier la cause initiale qui les avait créés. Je ne pense pas qu'aujourd'hui, ni en Angleterre, ni en France, ni en Italie, ni en Allemagne ou ailleurs, la préoccupation publique soit la première préoccupation des services patrimoniaux. Et euh, notamment, euh, se sont développées des prétendues doctrines, dont la charte de Venise n'est qu'un exemple parmi d'autres, qui ont fini, et puis d'autres, comme celle le, du culte du dernier état connu, qui ont fini par non seulement paralyser la restauration du patrimoine, mais surtout qui ont fini par trouver une justification à l'inaction. Et euh, de temps à autre, il faut des projets complètement différents, des projets perturbants, pour que tout le monde se repose certaines questions. Alors ce n'est pas confortable, ça vaut beaucoup de discussions, ça vaut beaucoup de polémiques, ça vaut beaucoup de querelles, mais je crois que cela fait bouger les idées. Le, le clocher de Saint-Denis, notamment, a fait l'objet d'un véritable interdit ministériel. Et aujourd'hui, on constate que non seulement c'est un projet qui est soutenu par le public, qui est soutenu par les historiens, qui est soutenu par les élus locaux, qui est soutenu par énormément de gens, au point même de le, de, de le financer, et que finalement, ce sont les services patrimoniaux de l'État qui étaient le plus en arrière dans la prise en charge patrimoniale. Parfois, ce sont des constats qu'il faut savoir faire. Le... Alors, encore une fois, c'est un peu perturbant, mais je crois que c'est indispensable. Merci, Merci beaucoup. beaucoup. Alors, Alors euh, plus de questions J'ai une question depuis l'Italie. Ah, ah. Bonjour, Bonjour Luigi. Luigi. Bonjour. Bonjour. Il y a un petit peu d'écho. Ça va de mon côté. Oui, je parle, je parle en français, j'essaye. Merci. Je et donc, et quand vous croyez qu'il sera terminé les travaux à Saint-Denis avec la reconstruction totale de la flèche Alors, au début, je souhaitais un chantier long parce que j'avais montré à la ville que le, la durée était un facteur de succès, un facteur de fréquentation et une manière de réintroduire la basilique dans la fréquentation publique euh, parisienne. Aujourd'hui, les élus qui ont une vision plus rapide euh, des objectifs m'ont demandé d'avoir un chantier, euh, du moins une opération qui dure au maximum dix ans. Euh, depuis 2022, le temps de faire le, les projets, de faire les fouilles, de faire la consolidation, le chantier va commencer l'année prochaine, à Pâques prochain. Les premières pierres seront euh, prévues pour Pâques prochain. Et c'est un chantier qui devrait durer six ans, cinq ans, peut-être sept ans. On va naviguer à vue euh, dans la mesure où le processus de taille va être un processus plus long que le processus usuel, et dans la mesure où nous, a, nous faisons de ce chantier un chantier de formation, pour ma part, plus il sera long, mieux il sera. C'est exactement pour ça que j'ai posé ma question, parce que c'est toujours comme ça. Non Les élus ont toujours des, des chantiers très courts, voisins euh, au temps de l'administration publique. Mais quand vous voyez 
Si vous choisissez des méthodes de construction comme ceux que vous avez choisis, qui sont les seuls, selon moi, qui peuvent arriver à reconstruire une sorte de philologie de construction, vous n'aurez pas de temps vraiment court. Il sera un chantier long pour couper la pierre dans une manière traditionnelle. C'est inéluctable, vous savez qu'un projet est toujours un dialogue avec plusieurs protagonistes. Euh, je ne peux pas demander aux élus d'aider un projet et de refuser euh, une, un délai qu'ils me donnent. Ça fait partie des discussions. Euh, je crois qu'on est à... Si on faisait ce chantier de manière, avec les techniques actuelles modernes de construction, c'est un chantier qui serait fait en deux ans, en trois ans maximum. Aujourd'hui, tout le monde a admis qu'il pouvait l'être en six ans. Là, je crois aussi que l'expérience apporte énormément de conviction. Euh, la, les élus, quand ils comprennent un objectif, changent les règles du jeu. Et je crois que lorsque l'on verra qu'il y aura plus de gens qui viendront visiter le chantier que visiter la basilique, ils comprendront que c'est le chantier qui dynamisera la basilique et qu'il vaut mieux le faire durer un peu plus. Les pédagogies de la démonstration. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci. Uh, OK. Um... But let's uh, go to the final discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Jacques Moulin. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi, for your questions. Um, let's uh, begin with the uh, final discussion. And we have about, well, 15 minutes, I think, before we have to go to the cathedral in Aachen. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Nasser to come here um, because we had a, a, a nice conversation and I think uh, you made a very good point why this Quite gathering nice. why this gathering was so important and I think it's very good to have to conclude with what we began with why are we here today right. sure thank you uh, thank you um, indeed we have an uh, interesting exchange in the break uh, thinking about uh, how this conference, uh, being an academic event, is related to practical matters that concern every European society currently because of the huge history of cultural loss and the need somehow to address this trauma and rebuild buildings that are not existing anymore, but they still are wanted and needed by the communities. Uh, and we also thought that um, such crucial exchanges as we have right now when people gathered from different countries in Europe and it's every, uh, actually a pan-European event can bring us different perspective in different contexts of which we probably are not aware of when we look uh, specifically of our national uh, uh, environment. Uh, and um, from that standpoint, I think that this conference being published on YouTube will uh, be accessible for broader public and will have a great impact in the future for future generation of researchers and architects who will address these questions, uh, especially given the current uh, state of the world, which brings so many challenges, uh, not only political, geopolitical, but also ecological, environmental. And we actually live in the time uh, when um, the loss becomes a ne uh, constant state of our lives, uh, starting from COVID pandemic and in current developments. So uh, from that standpoint, I think this conference will be important not only for the history of architecture and cultural heritage, but also from the philosophical standpoint of view, making us think about different aspects of authenticity and how can we reimagine our attitude to the past in the challenging present. So uh, thank you. And I invite other speakers to, to say a few words about the impressions. Yeah. Well, I, I'll... I think, I think we, uh, 
would struggle to add anything to what you you said because it was a very good um, conclusion, I think. But still, um, what do we think about reconstruction after this uh, two days? Do you have anything to add in the chat? No? Yes, everyone uh, wants to have a coffee. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, um, well, then we should, well, we, we can conclude and say that um, these were uh, two days, a uh, very interesting uh, exchange of ideas. And, uh, well, not much to add, really. That is, uh, no. So thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. And uh, I hope you learned a lot and made your mind uh, think about reconstruction and what it actually means. And it's just more than just stones. It's also about um, the heritage and what this heritage really means, the different layers of heritage. And uh, as uh, Jacques Moulin said, it's also about revitalization of a community, of recreating uh, old crafts and giving that to the next generations. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much.